All right. Hello, everybody. I'm trying to see if this is currently running. It is. I'm not, I don't have my headphones in today. So this is a, a slight change of pace from what I usually do. In fact, I might just go ahead and do that. Uh, but since you're not going to be able to hear my audio anyway, I don't really care. So tonight, this evening, we have the much anticipated uh, Devonian episode. So this literally took me like two months to do. Uh, if for any other reason than I just, for some reason, I, I try my best to uh, put out content in a reasonable time frame. But the, the thing is, is that I don't want to be wrong. You know, like I'm not trying to break my line of logic or break my line of reasoning just because I want to get too far ahead of myself. So I really have to thoroughly research most of what I'm saying, because when you deal with something like a critique, turnabout is fair play. You know, it's a double edged sword where people will try to pick through your content with a fine, uh, fine tooth comb. And I've learned this via my interactions with others on this platform. So by talking to people, just bantering, you know, I'll, I'll say inflammatory comments about evolution and bait people. That's what I've been doing for the last few weeks as I've been studying the Devonian. And the first thing I want to do is just address some key points. Before I even dive into the Devonian, I'm going to address some key points that people have brought up to me in the last few weeks of banter that I think are uh, necessary to address. And so this is kind of what I did. Like to anybody who's now looking at my content, uh, who I've either now or in the future get into a bant with, uh, realize that's the purpose. So my comments, they're, they're not publicly visible, I don't think. But if you do see my comments in videos, especially on videos related to evolution and animal development, you'll notice a theme and that's me being inflammatory. That's deliberate. I'm deliberately being inflammatory in order to get a response to get what arguments people are throwing out these days versus what I was used to hearing before. I want to address, and I'm not going to mention usernames because I'm not going to give them that level of attention, but I'm going to address uh, a couple a couple comments that I received. One is the actual mechanism for change in animals. In past streams, I've mentioned that the main mechanism or force for change in any animal is mutation. It's the only way you get new alleles. The only way you get new genes is by your body making a mistake when duplicating your genome in your germ cells. You can get mutations um, all over your body. You know, you can get a mutation in your lung that can give you lung cancer. You can get a mutation uh, in another, t in, in a patch of skin that'll turn in a different color, but it's only mutations in the germ cells that will then pass on to the next generation as, you know, the entire organism, like their genes and their absolute base genetic code is permanently altered via mutation. So whatever that does, whatever role that gene plays, whether, you know, it's a mutation that affects, you know, a pleiotropic reaction. So now it's completely messed with a bunch of systems and it's deadly and the creature dies. Or it could be like just something as simple as, you know, a Mendelian, a Mendelian trait. Like you're, I don't know. Like it's, it's like your, your peas outside. They're, they're now purple instead of pink or something. You know, it could be very, very innocent. And that is still basically evolution. That's what evolution is. It's a mutation of the genome that results in a different expression of alleles. That's what that is. People have been misconstrued and people in my comments have been throwing this out over and over again. That somehow the environment itself, the environment itself, the natural and sexual or via natural selection mostly is is what is causing the genome to change. It's giving the impetus for mutation and that the base mutation rate can vary uh, over time throughout species. And, you know, the base mutation rate of a species may, might have been higher in the past than it is now. That line of thinking requires proof. You know, that line of thinking requires evidence that the base mutation rates, the, the amount of mistakes that a genome makes during translation, transcription, and duplication is somehow magically speeding up and slowing down with whatever fits your current rationale. It's begging the question. You're assuming you're right purely because you have to be. It's like, oh, I, you know, this has to work this way because otherwise I'm going to be wrong. And if that isn't hubris, I don't know what is. Like what I'm hearing over and over again is that there's some kind of Lamarckist effect on the genome. Like, like I mentioned before, there are three to five redundant different proteins that check your genome for errors 
based solely on UV radiation damage. You know, there's redundancies in your genome to keep it as conservative as possible. The statistical likelihood of even having a mutation is so low that actual novel mutations showing up is actually rather rare. Like we'll get mutations happening at a pretty constant rate, but that's just because of the statistics involved, the sheer number of individuals, gametes produced, etc., and just lady luck. You know, you can have two people randomly meet, you know, on a sunny vista. They both took a flight and just happened to meet at this party. They're both from different sides of the country and they met and they fell in love and they could both be carrying a both recessive alleles for, you know, albinism or something. And they could have a bunch of albino babies. It's like, you never know what life's going to throw at you. You never know what kind of genes you're carrying, just waiting to rear their ugly heads. But their argument is, is that somehow, some way, the environment, just because a niche opens up or because a predator goes missing, predator release hypothesis, and you know all this that, oh, suddenly they're capable now. Like it's a capability potential thing. They're now capable of filling that niche. But that's a capability based purely on assumption. You're like, wow, you know, like the dominant predator just died. I know for a fact a creature is going to fill that vacuum eventually. And it makes sense. You know, if, if, if we see these sharks on screen, if sharks suddenly died out, you'd probably see like barracudas or some shit get bigger and fill that sort of niche. But the thing is, is that that is not what, drives evolution natural selection is how alleles express themselves and which alleles are the most successful it affects allele frequency the number or proportion of those alleles in a population versus other alleles so if this allele get confers an advantage its frequency is going to increase until it is fixed or conversely the other alleles will be so detrimental to survival that they'll eventually be lost so this fixation and loss are the two two sides of the of the of the coin when it comes to allele frequency this is what natural selection plays with this is the play-doh by which natural selection does its thing and you will see now phenotypic differences you'll see all of these different aspects of microevolution which are observable and testable but where it breaks down is this idea that just because a niche opens up or just because an animal is in a new environment that a that animal is destined to survive which no, most animals go extinct or die out very quickly after being resettled in a completely different niche or environment. You know, the cats on the island hypothesis, uh, the cats on the island example I mentioned in uh, earlier, earlier streams, I think it's Silurian or whatever. But we can't even talk about the Devonian yet unless people understand that. Unless people who come in in the future and watch what I, watch what I do, if you don't understand evolution as a concept, as the theory as it is purported by current scientific academic whatever dogma you want to call it if it's not that then don't even show up like don't show up to the table if you're not ready to eat because i'm sick of getting into bands with people who don't even understand evolution the the, the play-doh is there because of random genetic change even by their own hypothesis or theory or whatever you want to put it as by their own ideology this is how this happens you get new alleles from mutation to mutation alone you're not suddenly getting them conjured up just because the environment allows it to be so. In fact, we often see the opposite. We have entire lineages of creatures. Like I mentioned the field sharks and coelacanths, you know, in the in the previous stream. It's like, okay, the coelacanth has undergone massive changes to its fundamental niche. Yeah, it's slowly swimming around caves, but it's like the ocean oxygen levels, the ocean acidity levels, you know, temperature, uh, predators, you know, potential prey items. Those have all radically changed since the Cretaceous. And remember, we didn't even think that they made it to the KPG mass extinction. It's thought that they were already died out by the Maastrichtian. So when we actually see coelacanths in the modern day, despite all of the differences to the ocean structure and topography, all the structures and, and chemical uh, constituents that make up the ocean, you know, constantly changing over tens of millions of years, and yet we st still see fully recognizable coelacanths and fully recognizable frilled sharks and fully recognizable insects and arthropods and crustaceans, fully recognizable horseshoe crabs. You know, how is it that we can have a mass amount of conservatism displayed fully in nature based on designs that already work? A stasis that they say is 
is evolutionary stasis, a, a form of equilibrium that they have with their environment that other creatures just don't have. It's like their allele frequencies still change. They're still prone to effects of microevolution. They're no different than any other organisms. The difference is, is that they haven't gone through the cartoonish shape-shifting that comparative anatomists and geneticists and all of these other people with letters after their name have ascribed to be fundamental and obvious facts about the natural world. The animals can shape-shift into completely different forms radically and drastically and suddenly based on purely environmental impetus. That's just retarded to me. And I don't see where that is matching up with the actual mechanism of change. You can say, oh, this would be the perfect environment for X, Y, Z, but how is it going to get there? You can have the entire car, but if you don't have any gas, where is it going to go? New alleles only crop up through mutation or genetic editing. You can't get new alleles just because the environment wants to select for, it's like, who shows up plays you know what it's like the, it's not like a coach can snap his fingers and a, a new quarterback will pop into thin air it's like yeah you have your backup maybe special teams maybe another guy comes up it's like you have your players already you have who you're working with you can't just suddenly conjure new players from thin air and have that make sense just because you need a player doesn't mean they're going to be there and animals go extinct all the time, all throughout history, have learned this lesson the hard way. But instead of looking at extinction, instead of looking at all the all the practical ways that animals are, they have failed to adapt to a changing environment, we're obsessed with the idea that despite all of this, despite the obvious pressures that may, mostly make animals extinct rather than suddenly evolve them, we we think that these these other animals who who survived just miraculously shape shifted into the forms that they inhabit. So. There's a, there's a few things to tackle in the Devonian in terms of controversy that I could really, really touch on. One of the first, and I because I'm going to go into the fish and the shape shifting fish, but it's I'm going to touch on another topic that a lot of people really harp on about, especially climatologists and especially concerning climate change, and that's ocean acidification. So if we look at ocean acidification, we see that it's mostly because of how car of how CO2 becomes carbonic acid or increases the hydrogen ion concentration of the ocean as it dissolves in water. And when we look at this increase in hydrogens, you know, it's, you got to pay attention to your redox reactions to understand like these hydrogens are actively, that's basically what acid is a bunch of hydrogen ions. It's like you increase the concentration of hydrogen ions in the ocean when CO2 levels are high. Like this is something that, you know, even elementary school kids can wrap their heads around. It's just chemistry. So when we look back in the day though, CO2 levels, you know, remember this is pre-carboniferous, pre-mass sequestering of atmospheric and, and environmental carbon by massive forests. So the CO2 levels are some of the highest in Earth's history at this time. And even looking at the ocean, the oceans are, are relatively warm, the, and even, even by all metrics, the oceans are probably at least four times more acidic than the oceans are even today. Some of the highest CO2 levels in Earth's history during the Devonian. In fact, those high CO2 levels were the fuel that allowed the Carboniferous to, to flourish for as long as it did. All that flora feeding up and sucking up all that carbon in the atmosphere. So the Devonian is a precursor to the, to the Carboniferous and to this stage. So when we look at the Devonian, when we look at this, we also see 408 million years ago, the emergence of ammonites. They emerged in the early Devonian. And everyone knows kind of like what ammonites are, kind of like those shelled, they look like shelled squid. Um, they're, they're really cool looking. The Devonian said uh, to begin 419 million years ago. 419 million years ago, we have ammonites showing up 408 million years ago. These creatures were the largest shelled animals ever to exist some of them ha having shells reaching in excess three to five meters long long elaborate eventually horn curved and eventually completely curled shells and the nautilus i guess is the closest thing we have to an ammonite in the modern day but it's really interesting because one of the arguments is that oh well the acid in the ocean eats away at shells and like yeah it does it's like clearly doing that there is a strong correlation between high co2 levels in the ocean and the eating away at the calcium substrate 
found in the shells of marine organisms. Um, these are these are reflecting all kinds of studies, mostly on zooplankton and young fauna who just they just can't fix enough calcium into their shells. Those calcium ions are getting, uh, you know, they're going through redox reactions with those hydrogen ions. So it's dissolving it. It's, it's just not there. But simultaneously, we have the evolution of one of the lar of the largest genera of, of shelled animals ever to exist on the planet during a time where ocean acid, acid levels were higher than they've almost ever been, potentially. So, like, what's the explanation for that? And they're very long-lived. You know, they've, they've gone through a lot of changes in, in ocean acid levels. Maybe it's down to genetics. Maybe it's a response to stimuli. Maybe it's something that these creatures will eventually adapt to. Um, there's nothing saying that, you know, it's impossible for them to fix calcium into their shells if they develop the right alleles so those so the pressure is there for them to change but instead all we see is crisis like we don't see these animals miraculously bouncing back you know we see the bacteria who can you know eat plastic or at least certain kinds of plastic I think it was like pte or something but yours you see animals struggle for survival and you see that animals like oh they could really use a break like they could really use this mutation or this change to that Something small, something drastic, just a few changes to make the calcium fixation just more efficient. But you're not seeing that. You're not seeing that, oh man, it would just be so easy. But that's not, it's like no matter what the environment does, sure, they might eventually adapt to it. Maybe they won't. Maybe they're not like ammonites. Maybe they lack those genes to be able to properly fix that calcium into a calcium carbonate substrate by which they can build their shells. That's what I'm saying. You know, evolution doesn't give a shit about your feelings. It doesn't give a shit about your logic. It doesn't give a shit about your comparative anatomy. Evolution does not give a shit because the main mechanism for evolution is random genetic change to the genome, to the nuclear genome. Random change to the genome. There is no fucking way in hell you're going to have this beautiful deliberate oh niche is open guys let's go for it and i mentioned examples in nature where niches will open up and they'll remain unfilled for thousands of years why did tapers not fill up the gompathir niche and and the giant sloth niche left vacant why did it take paulo escobar's hippos to fill that niche why, why weren't they already transitioning into bigger body forms and these riparian like massive trunked tapers eating all it's like no they just remained tapers they just kept doing the taper thing They're like we're tapers the taper thing works because that's what nature does radical niche transition is just not observed in nature we see animals change niches but almost exclusively due to the fact that they are either occupying a very adjacent niche or they could already exploit that niche already being generalists or just having a series of traits that would allow them to do so in the first place you know, the garbage dwelling niche opens up by, America, by by cities. Perfect example. Who exploits the garbage niche? Well, animals that are really good at picking out a garbage. Okay, why are they good at picking out a garbage? Because these are animals that are already good at foraging. Their other niche is very similar. It's an adjacent niche. But in the Devonian, we're going to see radical changes in animals, animal physiology, animal structure, and animal genome, animal diversity, that is not like the raccoon learning how to forage out of the trash. Not like the blue jay learning to get up, get nuts out of the bird feeder. Not adjacent niches, but niches so radically different from their base niche that it requires and necessitates a massive change in, in physiology to every single major form and system and tissue in their bodies. The transition from fish to amphibian is so fundamentally drastic that even since its inception, this part of the theory of evolution has probably been one of the most contentious in history. How did fish become tetrapods? How did a fish walk on land? It is shown in political cartoons. It's revealed in the media. It's, it's something that has been a hot button point B besides the Cambrian explosion. And go to any channel and look up Devonian period. Devonian, it's like most anticipated, most looked up at. It's like it's something that everybody's dying to talk about because it's one of the most pivotal paradigm shifts in Earth history. When you finally had vertebrates coming onto land. But the time frame 
of all of this, thinking that, oh, well, you know, Neil Shubin found Tiktaalik and Tiktaalik had all these structures that, you know, looks like it helps it walk. And it has all these features to, you know, gulp air and, you know, all this stuff. And then, but it has all of these fish features, all of these traditional fish features. It's clearly a fish, but it obviously seems to be a transitional species. And that term transitional species really started with this. But as I've said before, there is no such thing as a transitional species. Every species on earth is adapted to its niche, either as a generalist or a specialist. There is no transitional anything on this planet. Animals have the niche and they're going for it. If a niche opens up and they want to exploit it, they have to already have the physiological tools available to do so. Otherwise, that niche will remain vacant and unexploited, with whatever repercussions or effects happening being up to anyone's guess. But we're being told that between 380 million years ago to 360 to 365 million years ago, so 10 to 15 million years, we're going from a lungfish like Eusthenopteron to fully terrestrial amphibians like Telerpidon. So what if fish have to change? What are the changes that fish, are, fish that this use of the Nopteron has to undergo to become an early amphibian? We'll start from the tip of the nose and go all the way to the tip of the tail. So now it has to alter its nasal passages to be able to smell on land. Maybe not changing the sensory receptors, but definitely the epithelial tissues that line the nose. Otherwise, they'll quickly desiccate. They have to be able to see on uh, uh, above above land you know maybe get an dictating membrane but just have some method of lubricating its eyes on dry land and then needs to be able to develop the ability to hear on dry land perhaps you know that's going to be further changes to its ear canal and auditory nerves and structures it needs a tongue so it's like you can't it's like look at mud skippers they have to barf water onto their onto their prey they're on in, in their mud flats and then gulp them up because they don't have a tongue by which they can swallow food. So they need to be able to swallow flu, uh, food and also have a peristaltic motion to force it down or something. But just a tongue. Let's start with a tongue. Just a tongue to swallow food. Then we go to the throat, of course. Uh, it needs a neck. You know, you can't, you know, in water, you can kind of deal without a neck. But on dry land, your, your head has to be able to move independently of your body. Because you're staying in one place, you have to be able to move your head especially if your eyes can't swivel in your sockets, you need a neck by which to catch prey and interact with your environment. So you need a neck. You need, you need differential cerv cervical vertebrae that can move independently of the rest of the body and independently even of the head. The head is turned, but the neck is meant to manipulate the head and all the sensory organs affiliated with the head. That shark doesn't have a neck. It's, it's, its skull goes right into its gills and throat. It's like there's no neck structure that a shark has if a shark wants to turn its body and turn its head it's like that's all one motion a shark if it turns its head it's turning its body it doesn't have a neck that it can swivel with so we don't see that none of these fish have necks you notice necklace fish necklace um, osteichthyes a neck is is a terrestrial thing and then you need fully developed shoulder shoulder girdle to support the weight arms to support that weight fully on dry land and then we move down to the ribs ribs have to be able to expand and contract support the animal's weight on land because otherwise buoyancy supports it and be able to breathe in and out and also develop lungs by the way not just little air sacs that can kind of subtly draw but enough oxygen that can actually be active on land and have that be almost its exclusive source of oxygen it could probably breathe through its skin whatever but even speaking of the skin it now needs to kind of make skin even if it's amphibian skin the skin needs to completely change completely altering the dermal structure and then we go deeper the muscles the muscles now have to be able to of course support the animal's weight it needs all the muscle groups needed for locomotion on land and it also needs all the muscle groups needed to, su to support tissues new bones the skeleton of course has to change the skeleton has to become more robust so that it can like support act the actual animal's weight and whatever physiological changes have to happen there. That's what we have the best evidence of. Reproductive system. You know, how are these animals, like even if they're spawning in water still, you know, they have to adapt the reproductive patterns to still spawn in water. 
and all that goodness. Until reptiles magically evolve the ability to uh, put calcium around their eggs, uh, but that that comes a bit later. Then we get to the hip girdle. Of course, the hip has to do the same thing the shoulder girdles did. All different mutations, um, all different regulatory genes. Then we get to, of course, the digestive system. The digestive system has to change. You're no longer living in a, in a permanently saline environment or a freshwater environment. You now have to be able to uh, adapt your stomach to accommodate the new prey that you're going to be feeding on. Probably not the hardest of all of them because uh, they're probably going to be eating a lot of the same things like arthropods that they were eating before. Or even just going back to the water to eat. And then, of course, the, the tail has to change. The tail changes. We see that, actually, by skeletal remains. It's not like, oh, they just have a fishy tail. So their, their tail changes because their hips change. And it's like, when you actually look at these animals, remember that 10 to 15 million years, humans and chimps diverged between 7 and 9 million years ago, around the same amount of time that panthers and, and, and uh, small cats diverged. Going back to like 11 or 12 million years ago, you get the split between gorillas and chimps. Go back to like 15 million years ago, uh, and you're getting a split that's more akin to like what? That's like the earliest estimate for, I guess, the split between, I guess, the great apes and the other apes, I guess. It's like, look at animals. Just look it up. Look at animals that diverge since like the Miocene. 10 to 15. It's like if you look at animals from 10 to 15 million years ago. And then their descendants today. It's like the easiest test to do. It's like, okay, we've gone through a lot of environmental changes. This is the coldest period in Earth's history, by the way. To say that we haven't gone through the same amount of change that was happening in the Devonian is, is a falsehood. But Devonian Earth was off the chain. It's like we see these massive periods of radiation, but it's really in the Devonian where it's not really a radiation of species. Of course, we get a lot of novel forms that are really cool, but it's the, how these forms of life change or appear to change in the fossil record that has people very interested because you start getting to margins as you creep up to Telerpodon. It's like, look at the fossil record in the so-called transitional forms between Eusthenopteron and the fully terrestrial amphibians. That 15 million year gap, 365 or 380 to 365 million years ago is all punctuated with these quote unquote transitional species that even between transitions undergo radical physiological changes. But remember what I said earlier, this is all being driven not by environment, not by some innate will of the creature to come onto land, to exploit this brave new world of, of insects and vegetation. The, the very plants themselves vascularizing suddenly out of thin air from moss and all of this diversity appearing on land. And they just swoop in because it's it's there. And there's there's high predator density in the streams. And there's low oxygen content. So they breathe. It's like, okay there, buddy. Then explain to me why, despite with all of, the, all of this perfect, perfect, does the base mutation rate of any animal support the, phys, the radical physiological changes that you're purporting? In that time frame, is there any animal mutating so fast in the modern day that it could even cichlids, even cichlids, even cichlids, they say it takes 100, 200 years for a cichlid to produce a new species through behavioral uh, and temporal isolation. Lake Tanganyika is full of different cichlids, although they make a new cichlid species every 200 years. It's like it's doing the same thing that we do with dog breeds, like they, they reproductively isolate based on behavior or reproductively isolate based on like what they eat or, you know, some courting ritual. And over time, because of inbreeding, they'll basically become a new form of cichlid. And I bet most of them, by actual terms, could successfully reproduce if they ever cross streams. The ones that can, I guess, oh, yeah, we'll have new species of cichlids. But those cichlids are not going to become a different type of fish. They're still going to be recognizably cichlid. They'll morph and change and stretch and alter their anatomy because of changes in allele frequencies because of novel mutations popping up more often than other creatures. But even with a cichlid's base mutation rate, you will never get the radical changes from bottom to top that you see between Eusthenopteron and the first terrestrial amphibians. That 15 million year gap. 15 million years is a long ass time. And I think people really, really think that 15 million years is long enough to fully transform
what's going on i hope i hope my stream didn't just completely die said something went wrong all right i don't know how much i just suddenly saw my camera go off so i think i'm gonna go back where i left where i just left off so that's gonna be yeah shark cam all right it'll tell me this time if it, if it goes off i'll know by the uh by the camera but you have 365 you have 365 million years ago just do stenopteron. You, you have the lungfish. You don't have any TikTok yet. You know, that comes a little bit later. But when did it start to change? Why did it change? That question, it's like, okay, there's too many predators in, 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 the, in the freshwater systems. Predator. It's like, okay, it's, it's to escape predators. Spend more time on land to escape predators. Okay. Wouldn't it be equally as efficient to just be able to swim away from predators? Or to get bigger and conquer the predator. What would be easier for a fish to do? Logically speaking, let's use parsimony. Let's use uh, let let's let's just look at existing species and what they do to adapt to a high predator environment. Let's look at the red queen hypothesis. Uh, we see that you know crabs like uh, or snails, other creatures like they'll go into this arms race. Like they'll in the response to predators, many snails will have spinier, thicker shells. If they know if there's predators around, they will adapt their physiology in practical, reasonable ways to deter this predator. Why in the hell would a fish, instead of just getting meaner or more armored, using practical pre-existing alleles and positively selecting for those, why would it undergo radical niche transition and a complete overhaul of every fundamental system in its body at breakneck speed just to avoid predators like or exploit a resource it's like even the impetus even the actual base explanations for why this happened fall brutally short of logic how is it logical to assume this when animals who already exist in high predator environments have their own adaptations to predators we see observable changes some animals, their strategy is to get bigger so that that predator is no longer a concern. You see this with American bison. It's like a puma is going to chase. What's a puma going to attack? A red-tailed deer or a moose? Which is more, more likely to get successfully attacked and killed? Some animals, they just get bigger. It's like, okay, I have to accumulate more resource, whatever. But if they can't get bigger, look at the pronghorn. You know, it's super fast. I think in response to the American cheetah, but it's super fast. It just outspeeds any other animal on the continent by a huge margin. Puma tries to go after a pronghorn. It's gone. And it's gone, gone. Like not even close. That's what, that's what animals do. Is that pronghorn suddenly going to be like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to become, you know, I'm, I grew up in these plains. I'm going to become bipedal and, and start knuckle walking. And eventually I'll be able to throw clods of dirt at the puma. Or it's like, oh, I'm going to spread wings and fly away, you know, because there's there's so many predators in this area. I think I'm just going to develop flight randomly and fly away. It's like, that's not how nature works. Like you have to still follow coherent paths of logic when you're explaining what stimuli result in certain biological responses or changes in ethology. What animal can mutate? And besides, what animal can mutate that fast anyway? What animal can drastically change its physiology in 15 million years that we even know of? Let alone a vertebrate. It's like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the nucleotide base pair differences between those first amphibians and fish are lower than what we see between amphibians and fish now because of just lengths of time. But looking at the regulatory genes, looking at basic fundamental aspects of the genome that have to be changed in order to create a, a terrestrial animal. It's so fundamental. Like these are fundamental genes that you're messing with. These are mutations in fundamental genes and it all has to line up perfectly. Like there's a bridge between like, okay, there's an allele that shuts off, you know, the gene for, you know, melatonin production, in the iris giving you blue eyes. There's a gene that helps you break down lactose. There's a gene that helps you break down alcohol. But what about a, a, a gene or a, muta a series of mutations that alter your regulatory genes in utero and then further, you know, alter these genes which are, are for bone development nervous development i'm like you're telling me that necks and tongues and and 
you know, per permeable skin with no scales and, you know, a skeleton's able to support their weight on land and all of these different features that have to come together pretty seamlessly just incrementally came about because of these quote unquote transitional forms. that are sometimes just 3 million years removed from one another. It's like you're taking the amount of time it takes, you know, a, a house cat to diverge from an Asian leopard cat and saying that an animal is able to go through radical physiological changes in that time frame. As much as 3 million years sounds like a long time, you're already having radical physiological changes with these quote unquote transitional species during this time. And what all these people who have banted with me in the past about keep forgetting is that the environment only affects the existing allele frequencies. The frequency of alleles will change based on natural and sexual selection. You will have certain traits appear, increase, they'll become fixed in the, in the species or lost, and that will change the allele frequency over time. That's evolution. That's what evolution is and has always been. A change in allele frequencies, which genes are present in the population, how many people are carrying a recessive of, a dominant of, a version of, several copies of a certain allele. But what we're seeing here are people trying to convince you that these shape-shifting animals came about by reasonable and rational re processes based off stimuli that are, you know, very understandable. And it's just, they are so full of themselves, they fail to see the, the faults in their own logic. They fail to see that modern animals don't respond to environmental stimuli this way. They don't respond to a high amount of predators by radically changing their physiology, nor could they. Just like they just make the decision that they're gonna go onto land because it's just free real estate. That's really the theory that you're working with, this Lamarckist horseshit that you will point out and castigate others for, but will fully embrace for your, for your justification for why animals are now walking on land. It's like you know that this is an insurmountable barrier to overcome based on your current pre-existing pre theory. So instead, you kind of like finger snap just like you do with the Cambrian and say, it's like, you know, man, they're trying to avoid predators. You know, there's nothing on land yet. Like they could afford to be, you know, a bit wonky and not perfect. And that's understandable. But that's not how evolution works. You know, evolution is not this zero-sum game driven intelligent thing it's like you say that evolution is random and doesn't care and that natural selection is the method by which animals can properly adapt to their environment but then at the same time you'll trace that back and act like animals going onto land was just a destined thing like they just went onto land because it was just a reasonable rational thing to do for this organism it's horseshit it's horseshit to assume that people can sit here and tell you about how random mutation is, about how unlikely it is for mutations to pop out, how conservative the genome is. And yet in the Devonian, we clearly see just a breakneck acceleration from lungfish, total fish, just straight fish, to terrestrial animals in the amount of time, you know, in, in, in the amounts of time where it takes one recognizable animal to become another by speciation, a time long enough to cause speciation, sure, but not speciation that radical, not speciation that unprecedented. Again, they would have to have mutation rates higher than any known existing animal on this planet Earth, including microbes. Like this is a level of genetic alteration that honestly shouldn't even be possible and probably isn't. The amount of base pair differences between a Telerpodon and a Eusthenopteron is astronomical. It's a hill that they really cannot overcome in the time frame they've set out unless the base mutation rate of these organisms was higher than anything we've ever seen before since the Cambrian. Like, that's what they really want you to think. So, on top of the ocean acidification ammonite question about whether ocean acidification is causing the problems or if it's just a lack of proper alleles to deal with the ocean acidification plaguing animals, we have to think about, first and foremost, you know, what, what, what also is, is affecting this? It's not just mutation. You have to think about how does mutation occur? Like if an animal has a mutation and it inherits that from a parent, like there's an alteration in the germline, the chances of genetic drift or just random sampling, removing that trait from the population forever is incredibly high. 
And this is what usually happens. It's very rare that an entire clutch of eggs will inherit the same mutation unless all eggs derive from that one zygote. So in most species, what you're actually getting is a mutation that occurs in typically just one individual that then eventually will fix in the population because of genetic drift too. It's like they luck out in sampling bias and they have a preferentially chosen trait based on natural selection. And over time, that trait will fix. And we do see that sometimes. But because there is that percentage or that total amount of alleles, novel alleles that are lost by genetic drift, we're not going to see, you know, every single, we're going to have to have traits re-evolve. You know, you're going to have to have the same mutation happen again to make this work because we're also assuming that genetic drift was just not a factor or that it acted solely in a positive way for every single trait that emerged. So not only do we have to look at how likely it is to get these traits in 10 to 15 million years, we also have to assume that genetic drift just need not apply. Like the Hardy-Weinberg principle, we're like, well, we're just going to assume that, you know, if factors of this aren't applied, it's like, well, you can't assume anything. You can't assume something doesn't apply or isn't a factor just because you don't want it to. Mutations very rarely fix in an entire population unless it is so beneficial that it helps everybody or, or it appears in multiple individuals at the same time. Like we see that, like lactose genes, like, man, those fix pretty quick in a lot of populations. They're still not at fixation. You know, you're, you still don't have 100% of people in, in England or Europe or anywhere in, North, in, in, anywhere in Europe have 100% representation of lactose tolerant individuals. The gene might be ubiquitous, but it's not absolutely universal. So what we see in nature is not this beautiful pattern of animals transitioning into these new forms because the niches are there. We see animals who very clearly stay in their lane and do what they know is going to help them survive and reproduce. And that natural selection acts on the alleles that they have within their genome and that they're expressing right now. If this allele helps them grow faster, if this allele gives them better night vision, if this allele gives them a better sense of smell, it's going to be selected for. And the chances of the chances, it's not a guarantee, you know, that there, there might, you know, it might be pipe like Chad shark, you know, swimming through the ocean you know, per, like can smell a drop of blood from 15 miles away. Just great nose and then boom, you know, gets tagged by another great white shark, a bigger shark that just swam from underneath and got, it's like, you know, there's all these different things going on. The chance of one individual reproducing and passing on its offspring, you know, it's miraculous. You know, the, the gift of life is miraculous. But unfortunately, what we're getting is a bunch of armchair biologists who sit around and like want to want to talk shit about how miraculous evolution is in like a SciShow comment section or a PBS Eons comment section. And what they're doing is they're circle jerking over something that literally is not even proven by science. It's like something that if you actually look at it in an objective light, doesn't make any sense from a scientific perspective. And instead you get a bunch of people patting themselves on the back. acting like they're so fucking smart. When they are, it's when they're directly lying to people's faces about how much we actually know for certain about the origins of life. These people will sit here and tell you that ter terrestrial animals came from fish in a time span, not even sufficient to, to even to bear uh, barely enough time to turn a gorilla to, to help the gorillas and chimps diverge from one another. You know, this is, this is the time frame we're talking about the amount of time it took yak and bison to divert or yak and cattle to diverge from one another, or the amount of time for big cats and small cats to diverge. You're getting, TikTok becoming a fully terrestrial amphibian. Like, dude, miss me with that shit. I'm sorry. I don't, it's like, we're assuming like that the base mutation rate is higher in these organisms, even if it was, like I said, with the cichlid example, even if they had a cichlid mutation rate, even if their mutation was higher than any other animal on earth, it is still an amount of time and it's still an impetus, a, a, a selective factor that doesn't make any sense based on the current environment and experience in the Devonian. Why in the hell would it go into a completely hostile and foreign ecosystem like dry land where it has zero adaptations? Oh, it can, it can, it has these arms and help it move through the water. Like, yeah, cool. We see that in modern animals today. Look at stonefish, look at coelacanths. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not something unique to these animals. It's not a sign that they're going onto dry land. It, it's, it's, a, it's like this is what you do when you live in shallow waters or live in water with a lot of debris. Or you have a bit or you're a benthic organism but to fundamentally alter your entire body from nose tip to tail and some of the most fundamental genes in your body like regulatory genes just to facilitate the sea to land transition in what 10 or 15 million years give me a break dude 
the amount of time it took chimps and humans to diverge, you're going from Tiktaalik to, to salamanders. Like, get, I'm, I'm just, it is one of those things. It's like saying that whales descend, descend from sheep relatives. It's just like, it's just one of those things where if you actually take a step back and look at, look at the science, look at the data, look at what we have, it doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, we're totally always told to use Occam's razor when it comes to building trees of phylogeny. But they use like, oh, well, genetics and molecular data, uh, we, we use bootstrapping and, and a bunch of other techniques to, to show that, oh, wow, they, they converge uh, within artiodactyla and are most closely related to hippos. And then next by, by pig, it's like, like, so you're going to sit here and just say, oh, well, you know, we acknowledge that there's convergences in morphology and even convergences in the genome uh, because of base associated traits and how proteins usually manifest themselves in mutations for certain functions or certain adaptations to certain environments. But uh, no, we're pretty sure that uh, that whales came from Pachycetus and that again, in just 10 to 15 million years, that miracle window, they went from a fully terrestrial wolf-like artiodactyl to a fully aquatic bacillosaurus that time frame being 58 million years to 48 million years ago just 10 million years again about the amount of time it took uh it's actually less time i even think than the gorilla and chimp divergence example i had the last common ancestor of gorillas and chimps was older than the terrestrial ancestor of all cetaceans and the fully aquatic cetaceans themselves like, let that sink in for a second. Let that sink in to realize that base mutation rate is the is the fuel that pushes that pushes evolution forward. That that is how new alleles are created. You're going to tell me that randomly it all just worked out, like all the Big Bang shit and all the abiogenesis shit. It just randomly just worked out that way, and you have no fucking evidence. You're like, well, it's random, bro. You never know. And so these people who act like they're so fucking smart and act like they're so fucking educated are just blowing smoke out of their ass because they don't know. It's like scientists don't want to say that they don't know because we don't know. Again, people come to this channel thinking that, oh, he's going to give us all the answers. I'm here to tell you we don't have all the answers. I'm here telling you that anybody who thinks that they have an answer is full of shit. Nobody has the fucking answers to these questions. These are things that we barely know anything about. And yet people are so fucking cocksure confident about the natural world that we're almost fooled into believing, like, well, it's so logical. I'm like, what's logical about it? What is logical about shape-shifting lungfish? What's so logical about ocean, uh, the most acidic oceans Earth has ever seen producing the most large and extravagant shelled organisms that we've ever seen in the fossil record? Ammonites appearing in ocean CO2 levels were four times higher than they are today. And Eustonopteron becoming the ancestor of all of us because it decided, like, because of predator pressure... And a bunch of free real estate that it's going to slither its its chunky ass on land and develop, you know, every single system, every single process from its skin down to its bones, changing every single part of its body. Just just to exploit this niche that opened up like that's what they're selling to you for the Devonian. And then of course, just like every cycle of creation, and destruction, everything we've ever seen. The the end Devonian mass extinction event nebulous as a motherfucker we don't know again don't know what happened but people of course oh it's climate change. oh it's volcanism oh it was the traps in in india or something it's like there's always a like oh bruh i got it like there's always that gotcha moment where they're like oh well how did the the, the devonian end like oh suddenly we see uh all this community stratification and we see all this differentiation of niches and then we see this mass extinction event that then leads to another radiation event in the Carboniferous. Like we see all the time. These cycles of rapid creation and destruction that we see time and time again in Earth's fossil record. And we've just put it down to like, well, you know, natural selection and then speciation, niche radiation, and then man, just a random catastrophe. And everything is random. Everything is just numbers running. Like Earth is just one big fucking supercomputer running a random fucking number generator and it's just everything's just going in its chaos it's like these are like chaos cultists or something like they don't actually believe in ordered scientific method these are people who want to think that just because you know they can't explain something that obviously must be random and the numbers support it everything is random nothing is ordered nothing is planned nothing is deliberate unless it behooves them 
you know, this was planned. Like there's nothing more planned, nothing more directed and intelligent. The idea that a fish is going to transition onto land just because the opportunity is there to do so. Doesn't matter how fucking on the precipice this organism is of ch radically changing its niche. The actual aspect of the change has to be supported by science, has to be supported by that base mutation rate, has to be supported by all these things going right sequentially in order for it to radically change its niche so fucking drastically in such a short period of time. Again, 10 to 15 million years is a long ass time to anybody. In a historical sense, it doesn't even, it's like that's like. 15 times longer than the entire human story. But in a geologic sense, in a biological or genetic sense, the genome is so fucking conservative. Again, almost three different redundancies in the human genome just for UV damage alone. The, your genome does not want to mutate and you have to have the mutations in your germ cells, just the cells in your balls that produce gametes or ovaries, if you're a woman, that produce gametes. You have to have a mutation there. So not in like one of your body cells, you have to have it there too. So it's like the statistical likelihood of that cell developing that mutation and then passing it on from one individual to the point where it's fixed in a population and then happening over and over and over again, every generation. That's what has to happen. Even in the 7 million year time frame between humans and chips, you still have to acknowledge 44 novel gene mutations per, per generation to get a human from a chimp in the time it took them to diverge. 40 million base pair differences, 20 million each if you want to break it up even. You look at the actual base pair differences between these two organisms, and you're like, okay, dude, what in the fuck is this shit? The timing, the math, the genomic models, none of them make sense. Every model done trying to emulate natural evolution has not worked out. All of the parameters they enter do not correlate with what we see in nature. People ignore that shit. Trying to make models and simulations of actual real-life nature is impossible. And that tells you that there's factors at play that we don't know about. That's what the conclusion of that, of that study is. It's an if-then. If we know all the conditions and parameters, then this simulation will positively and truthfully reflect what we see in nature. That is the hypothesis when people make these models. And if you focus on the hypothesis, you'll find out that the result, the null hypothesis being rejected, proves that there's factors that we don't know about that are outside of our control yet we still act like we know fucking everything about an earth that does hasn't even existed hasn't even existed in a third of a billion years like 380 million years is such an ungodly amount of fucking time i can't imagine it i don't know anybody who can even imagine 380 years of life but 380 million years is so fucking old it is so fucking old. You are, you, are, you are basically closer to fucking jelly, only jellyfish in the oceans than you are to modern life. Even that, it's like you are that fucking old. That you're, that you're closer to fucking primordial jellyfish in the Precambrian, the art of the modern day. Like that's a, that's a bonkers ass length of time ago. And anybody saying they know about it is kind of full of it. So... I don't know, I'm going to I'm going to address the chat. Yeah, I I am back again. So I'm 53 minutes into the stream. I don't know, there was like a a glitch or something. I don't know if my stream's going to be posted as this. It says the time is like 53 minutes. So I'm just assuming it's all Gucci and then I'm not, you know, posting two different streams in the Devoni and I'll I'll keep both up in case that does happen, but it looks like it's continuous. But yeah, welcome back Emmanuel. Uh tonight covering the devonian i i i wanted to have more to say because on my other streams are like two hours long and they're jam-packed full of content and the devonian really is such an interesting time we saw you know like animals like our plants like cooksonia magically develop vascular tissues and proliferate and i can get really deep into the details but i've been trying my best to like really adequately explain my points by bantering with people off youtube like I go through YouTube comments and I'm trying to see what people say and what they say, it, it's made me have to take a step back and really explain to them, like, you don't actually understand what evolution is. And that's what I get every time I argue with armchair biologists on YouTube. They forget that mutation is a random process, that natural selection is the directional process by which things happen. 
but that there's different times like directional selection is only one type of selection there's balancing selection there's disruptive selection like there's there's different types of selection that happen but microevolution is fascinating it's observable and testable but what they forget that micro macroevolution is just fucking shape shoot shape shifting cartoon animals and you have to explain even on these times they, they obfuscate it with time scales that seem like they make sense but the math doesn't check out lay people aren't able to wrap their heads around base mutation rate they don't understand that the base mutation rate is so fucking low I, like i could send links if you if you actually put in an animal's base mutation rate simulate five thousand generations and then see how many new alleles appear or what the allele frequency change will be like just because of genetic drift alone the chances of that shit happening is is really small like you're not going to see Maybe you'll go 5,000 years and maybe not even seeing a single new allele. I mean, look at the, look at all the, con, the living fossils that we see today. Like it's obviously the case. Like they, they haven't been changing alleles much. So this idea that animals, just because it's there, it's like this deterministic bullshit that they want to shove down our throats that just because it's there, it's going to happen. That this random, gen, that this random muta mutation rate is, is going to accelerate when it behooves us and slow down when it doesn't. And that every animal is a different mutation rate. And some animals mutation rates are like, the speed of light and then they slow down it's like no modern amphibian has a base mutation rate fast enough to become a reptile in 10 or 15 million years no no sea lion has a mutation rate capable of making it a a fully aquatic like dugong or whale in 10 to 15 million years and yet i'm being told that a, a hoofed animal can become a whale in 10 to 15 million years a fucking aquatic animal already aquatic can't become that into the, based on its own mutation rate and yet i'm to believe that this fucking artiodactyl can that pachycetus can become bacillosaurus or dorosaurus or, or, or dorodon in 10 or 15 million years like dude what in the fuck like that doesn't make any sense to me it's so this is what constantly happens emmanuel we see cycles of creation and destruction all the fucking time in the fossil record like every single period of natural history we see is basically punctuated by like it's millions of years a massive radiation of flora and fauna and then immediately following that we see what massive radiation a somewhat stasis of time and then mass extinction and there's like five of them it's like every single major period of history you can think of every delineation in the in the genomic geological record is actually punctuated as such because basically because there is this pattern that they notice and it makes it really easy to chop it up into chunks they make this up it's an artificial system but it highlights that the cycles of creation destruction we see on earth are patterned there is a pattern of creation and destruction that we see time and time again in earth's history this pattern is now actually assumed to be random it's assumed to be fully fucking random completely fucking random so these cycles of creation and destruction are completely random and explainable away because what they don't want to do is a admit that they're wrong and b admit that there might be some sort of other impetus that does not involve evolution they don't want to even open the door to the idea of something like intelligent design. They don't want to open up the idea to something anomalous beyond their control, something quantum entangled. They don't want to open up that can of worms and say that some other field or some other discipline or some other ideology is responsible for the way they think about the natural world. They don't want to admit that other people might be right in some respect or regard to the Earth's natural geologic history. Instead, they want to come up with their own theories, their own inferences, not based on evidence, not based on the you know, scientific method. They look at periods that are hundreds of million years in the past that we have scant evidence of, sometimes so old that we barely even have geologic record of it, and then coming out with theories and hypotheses that are not testable, that are not scientific, but purely just plug holes in their dogma that they can't easily cover with provable factual evidence instead of inductive and deductive reasoning being the ultimate source of their logic and of their uh of their you know implications i guess you can call them their implications 
about the natural world. They instead just, you know, get really pearl clutchy about shit and act really put off if you decide to challenge their their opinions. It's like, how are you any different than the Catholic Church? When you when you will crucify scientists like Richard Lenski for pointing out that asexually producing organisms don't really evolve in a, in a way that we like assume they did in the Proterozoic, or that you know the base mutation rate of animals is a rather constant thing, that transcription error and reproduction error is kind of the only thing that can really change your base, you know, amount of alleles, that no changing of allele frequencies by microevolution is going to induce new alleles appearing. Like natural selection is not a force that will create new alleles. Only random mutation to the genome will do that. Natural selection will affect allele frequencies, which alleles are being expressed in what percentage of the population. It will not give any impetus to the genome to create new genes. People in the comments who argue with me in, like I said, PBS Eon videos and Benji Thomas videos in like, what is it? Henry the Paleo Guy videos, Edge video. Edge is a big, Edge will actually banter with me directly. It's pretty funny. But it's like with all these guys forget, it's like no amount of allele frequency changing due to natural sexual selection happening over here affects this realm, the genome, the actual mutation rate of your genome. That is what drives evolution you're not going to get the flippers you're not going to get the change in dentition you're not going to get the nictitating membrane you're not going to get the insulin you know insulin factor whatever protein you're not going to get any of that shit unless it randomly comes about by a change in some gene locus by duplication by single point alteration by some sort of something happening there's a lot of things that can happen when it comes to mutation, but radical changes to the karyotype, random changes to the phenotype, random changes to the animal physiology have to be based upon rather simultaneous and consecutive changes to the genome that cannot be lost by genetic drift or random sampling. You know, these animals not only have to survive to fix their genes in the entire population or almost universally fix it, but then they have to pass that on generation after generation to have the same process happen slowly but surely so that these quote-unquote transitional species can reach their evolutionary end destination a random process with an end destination so you say that it's like oh it's very lamarckist and very linearly thinking and you know and antiquated to assume a, pro a slow progress from ape to man or from you know eohippus to equus but that's kind of at the end of the day exactly what they're saying. Like they'll point out the faults of logic in Lamarck's theory. They'll point out the faults of logic in basically every single realm of life. But then they'll ignore Louis Pasteur's experiments when it comes to only life beginning life and still stand behind abiogenesis. Despite an overwhelming mountain of evidence from microbiological studies that have not only supported Louis Pasteur's findings, but also you know directly conflict with the idea that random molecules can assemble themselves into a life form. Decades of research, decades of experiences have proven that fruitless. And similarly, models on mutation rate do not actually correlate with what we're seeing in animals. Again, the models that we've built have rejected the null hypothesis that if we understand every factor that goes into evolution and genomic change, then our models should reflect what we see in the natural world almost perfectly and they don't even come fucking close so like what factors are we missing are we going to sit down and are we going to actually ask ourselves you know what the fuck we're doing are we going to ask ourselves like you know are we are we going to tell ourselves like this it's like you know we thought that the earth was the center of our solar system so how did we prove that wrong how do we take a ubiquitous idea and basically and and basically alter that you know, how did, how did we get from that one point to another where we said, okay, we are going to sit here and figure out what's going on. Like the earth was the center of our universe because we saw all the stars and all the heavens move around us every night. But we realized like, oh wait, constellations change. And that, you know, there are factors here. It's like we could see that, oh, well, we know that the earth is round because I can put a stick here. 
I can measure the angle of the sun at noon, and in Alexandria, it's going to be at a certain angle. And in, in, in Upper Egypt, I forget what the city is, like Luxor or something, it's going to be at another angle. And like early Egyptian and Greek philosophers figured out that the earth was round. It's like the Roman word for, for earth was ordibis. And so it's like the whole flat earth thing doesn't make sense because even the ancients knew the earth was round just by experimentation. Same thing happened with the earth. It's like you can clearly see once you understand that the earth is in the center of the solar system, you, you a lot of things make more sense. Like mathematically, you can prove based with physics. It's like, wow, it makes much more sense if everything was orbiting the sun in terms of how our astrological objects change in relation to one another than if it was just orbiting earth and they just kind of randomly do their thing. Like if they're following orbits, so if they're following orbits around the sun, then their movements make more sense in relation to the earth. So because we saw the planets in the sky long before we could see individual like solar systems or whatever in distant stars. So we saw how like Mars and Venus and Jupiter change because we actually found those planets pretty early on. Venus is actually one of the brightest stars in the sky. So it's like or brightest objects in the sky, I guess you could say. So it was very easy to prove once you actually got down to brass tacks and, you know, put a little, you know, telescope to the sky, you could, you could see that, you know, and we use tools, we were inventive. It's like, you know, those periscopes were used for like ocean dwelling vessels. And then we just kind of tilted it up a little bit and microscopes were sort of the same, like playing with lenses. We got there because we used human ingenuity and a little bit of think to, to, to wonder like what is a more logical explanation for the movements and celestial movements we see is it random bullshit the earth is circling us and all these stars just randomly move about or is it the more structured and understandable model of planetary objects orbiting around a larger life-giving sun the sun rises and sets not because you know not because of anything else but earth's rotation and its movement Yeah, it's it's globalist propaganda. But so so where is so why do people what is the point of of an evo, a macro evolutionist mindset? It's the same thing I ask myself concerning abiogenesis. Their belief system, they've replaced religion per like a religious system or spiritual system with one of materialist randomness. It's like you can't be – It's the thing is, is that it's set up to be diametrically opposed to any sort of religious or spiritual explanation of life. It's diametrically opposed to, to, the, to intelligent design, for example. It doesn't want there to be intelligent design. You know, you, your, our genome basically looks like computer code, yet it can't be intelligent design because that will do what? It's like you, you're already making up theories on how and why shit happened with no evidence – so why fundamentally reject intelligent design? If it's like you, you're you saying things came about randomly isn't supported by the data. It's not supported by the scientific method. We don't see order emerging from chaos. We don't see life coming out of non-life. But for some reason, for some reason, the idea of some sort of intelligent design creating or sowing the seeds of life on this planet, even if you believe in evolution... Believing in abiogenesis and evolution, which most academics do, hmm, you know, that doesn't bode well to me. You know, that, that doesn't scream, I'm very confident in what the fuck I have to say. What it tells me, oh, what is this doing? I'm playing with StreamYard a bit. Oh, no. Well, that's peculiar. But what it's telling me, basically, is that I don't really know what the fuck I'm talking about. I don't know you know, anything but the fact that it can't be this. It can't be this. It can't be this or that. I'm here to critique this and tell you that no one has the fucking answers about this shit. The reason why they act like they have the answers, the reason that they want to have the answers is they are desperately afraid of people with alternate ways of thinking ever being right. They want the average person to think there is no God there is no purpose to life. Everything is random chaos. There is no nothing deeper behind the veil. It's all just what we see right in front of our eyes. It's like Plato's allegory of the cave. All these people do is chase fucking shadows. They use techniques and methods that have been slowly built up over the 20th and late eight and late 19th centuries to 
basically try to revolutionize science. They come up with new genomic methods. It's like all this new technology that can be used for so much good. And instead of giving millions to, to research that will directly benefit humanity, they've spent millions trying to make life in a lab. They've spent millions trying to prove people of religions and spiritual and alternative ways of thinking wrong. It's like even the panspermia guys, like, oh, life came from outer space or that life was seeded by aliens. They'll scoff at you, be like, well, that's fucking ridiculous, bro. Everyone knows life came from nothing. It's like, that's literally the position they take. There's, they have so much fucking hubris that if I come down and say aliens seeded life on Earth, they would laugh at me. It's like if I said that in a lecture, they would fucking laugh at me. I believe aliens seeded life on Earth. If I said that shit, they would laugh in my face. But it is still a better explanation than life coming from nothing. Because one is supported by evidence. You know, one is supported by evidence. Oh, life had to come from somewhere, so where did it come from? One theory... Life had to come from somewhere. You know, it exists. So where did it come from? One theory. Well, what if I say life has always existed? What if I say that life's existed since the dawn of the universe? Life's existed since the dawn of the universe. Life's existed this entire fucking time. Is that the... Okay, we can... But we see an earth and Haiti and da, 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 that there was no life. Like, what if it was in the atmosphere? And, or what if the rock that was is so old that we don't have any examples of it? What if life was here since the Hadean? And that... You know, it used to be adapted to the lava. It was all, all extremophile archaea. And then they just slowly evolved. It's like, what if life has always been here? What if it was here when the sun was forming and there was, you know, little particles of dust that were little archaea spores? What if the sun made life? You know, like, like, you know, they're not even trying to be creative about it. They just want you to think that, oh, fucking amino acids and lipid, fucking phospholipids and you know, some free floating RNA came together and yeah, bada bing, bada boom, man. You got it first. So it's like, my guy, you're expecting me to think that a, a, a tornado happening in an in and out is going to make me a burger. Like, are you, are, are you sitting here and telling me this shit, acting like you're a scientist, acting like you know shit, but you're basically feeding me a line of snake oil bullshit. Yeah. So, yeah. You can have a fish just all of a sudden get on land. And all of a sudden is 10 million years. But like I said, 10 million years is the only amount of time it took bison and cattle to diverge. Like that's not enough time to turn from a fish into an amphibian. It's like you're expecting me to think that you can go from a lungfish to a primitive salamander, even though the base mutation rate would not even support that. You can go from like a lungfish to like a weirder looking lungfish. Like you could, you could have physiological adaptations that can help you get on land be like a mud skipper but the base mutation rate doesn't support it the base mutation rate how many new alleles are actually showing up in a population it's like maybe you'll get a couple in a century you know getting to decent numbers but you want you have like like the human chimp example like 44 novel mutations per generation to get to the genomic difference between a human and a chimp 40 million base pair differences divided by two over two lineages assuming that both lineages have equally diverged from their ancestor 40 million base pair differences is 44 novel mutations per generation that have to occur. And that doesn't happen. It's like even looking at human to chimp, something not even that different, you know, like not like it's huge, but not like amphibian to fish huge or fish amphibian. Like the sea to land transition with arthropods and crustaceans already miraculous in the time frame it happened. But then to take terrestrial, to take a, a vertebrate, bruh. Like that's, that's too much to me. Like that's just, the data just doesn't support it. Neil Shubin I, is really cool fossil dude, but he's the biggest proponent of this. When he found TikTok, he was like the first dude to come out and say it's, oh, it's proof. And it's just like, Neil Shubin, shut the fuck up, dude. Like go back to hunting fossils, bro. Like if you're going to sit here and try to like have lectures and shit about, you know, the transition of life onto land when you don't really know fucking shit besides how to find fossils, you need to sit down, my guy. But, oh, thanks. I, I grew this out for Halloween. But to be honest, I think I'm going to keep it. Because, like, I, I do like the face. I got a trimmer. And I think it just looks good, better on me than being booty face at this phase of my life. Like, I get a lot more positive attention from, from the ladies. And it's, like, it's weird because I originally went booty faced Because I used to have facial hair like this in my 20s. I originally went booty faced uh, because of a poll on Instagram of, like, should I shave the beard or not? But 
at my age now, I think that it really works out. And I don't know, like I can actually grow like fairly dense facial hair. And I couldn't actually do like my, my mustache, for example, is way thicker than it was at 20. My, my at 20, because of all the red, like my, my mustache was actually rather wispy. Like you could have barely seen my mustache and it barely connected. But now I have a really strong connection between my mustache and my beard. And I have a very strong representation here of like my, my beard patch. So I feel like it works out. And I have like the chin strap going on. I had the goatee and now I'm growing back. The, the, you can see it more from this angle, but I'm growing back the chin strap. So I'm just like a hairy beast. And I walked up. So I went to the Halloween party on the 28th in, in Cal Poly Humboldt. And I guess the stream's going to take a left turn from here, I guess. But but I did that at Cal Poly Humboldt. And the funniest the funniest thing about that was... Uh, oh, can I, can I, I want to like get this. But it's like the funniest thing is like... So I approached this group of girls, right? And I was a vampire. Like I had the vampire fangs and then I, uh, and then I was wearing all black. So I was like, I was already sauce. Like I had my like black flask. I got that. Where is it? So I got this black flask for, uh, for Christmas last year and I filled it up with Smirnoff vodka. And what I did is I went, through, I was already kind of sloshed. I'm like, I have to drive home. I'm probably going to go home at like 12, find an after party if I can. And I was like, let's go for it. Like, I want to, I want to try to find an after party, but, uh, yeah. Um, the only thing that happened was I like go up to these girls and like try to play pool and they're cute, but it's like, they got together and they were like put off like, Oh, what's this guy doing? And they're like, Oh, well, we're going to leave and try to go see like the, the band that was playing, which was like uh destroy boys. And I'm like, Oh, do you want me to tag along and they're And they gave me this look like they didn't. I'm like, you do realize I'm going to see you there, bro. Like, I don't get how sometimes like these academics, like I kind of realize too why people comply with these narratives um, like this, like, so this type of science is just science. And when you actually talk to people who are supposedly scientists or supposedly studying science, it's like, they're not really studying science. They're not really actually looking at the scientific method. It's like, they're learning how to read articles and they're learning how to fucking, you know, take notes, but they're not actually learning how to do science. It's like all these like masters and PhD students are being handheld by the professors. They're basically being groomed by their professors to enter a certain field or another. And so it's like, you know, I know too many people who are PhDs in a certain subject or a certain part of their field purely just because their coordinating professor studied that. And it's like, really, dude, like you go through all that effort to get a PhD and you're not even going to do the shit that you wanted to do. It's like, well, I couldn't really study, uh, I couldn't really stu study copepods because the program for that, you know, I, I didn't get into it. So I, I had to go and study hymenopterans instead. It's like, if I'm going to go all the way to achieve a dream of being like a zoologist or like a PhD in academia and then not still not be able to really study what I really want to do. I'm like, that's cucked. It's like as cucked as the military. It's like as cucked as, you know, like I'm going to go through all this pain, blood, tears and effort, and I'm still not going to do what I want to do. It's like, bro. For me, I don't, I just want to help animals. Like I, I'll, I'm fine. Like, you know, working a day job and then volunteering at a wildlife center. If that's all I do with my degree, I don't fucking give a shit. Like I just want to help, but it's like, I'm surrounded by people who just want to walk around with a massive stick up their asses acting like they know shit. And it's like, they don't fucking know shit. It's like the narrative that's being pushed is a bunch of leftist materialist garbage. And what I hate about it is that the politics involved make it seem to that like, oh, well, we can't be realistic about about it's like there's no subspecies of human beings there's just you know one race human race i'm like even though fixation distances between bantu africans and scandinavians is more distant than american gray wolves and coyotes you're gonna sit here and say that there's no it's like when you can look at the skeleton and tell what race somebody is you're gonna sit here and tell us there's no species differentiation between humans but it applies to everything else like you see politics rear its ugly heads like how many fucking like fish and beetles are named after barack obama like let's just be clear you know, like this is this is a whole, a whole lot of people who let their personal opinions interfere with how they conduct science, with how they go through with the scientific method. It's like you can't trust these people. And a lot of these papers aren't even peer reviewed. Like you go through and it's like, OK, you, you, you have a sample size of fucking 91 and you're you conducted this study for five years and now you're going to use this as a precedent. Like, it's like common law. It's like you're going to use this as something precedential to fucking, you know, go on and 
oh well, you know, obviously I'm referencing a, uh, uh, you know, McGillicuddy at all for this for this study on bison ethology. It's very clear to me that, and it's like, okay, dude, you're, it's just again, you're jerking yourself off. It's like you build an entire paper referencing 13 other papers, like five of which maybe have a peer review. And of those five peer reviews, the peer is like a close associate from the same lab. And it's just like, dude, it, even looking at metadata analysis, when you actually get into the nitty gritty and dig through these, which laymen don't do, you know, people commenting in, in comment sections on YouTube, don't do this shit. Actual zoologists and actual researchers and actual, you know, people studying these subjects have to do that. You will soon find that like even coming, doing the Devonian, like I actually have to just go to mainstream websites because I reference a specific paper about ocean acidification and the amount. And you have like this stuff like t tangentially thrown in, like very few people have actually just outright done an, as an ocean acidification study based on rocks in the Devonian. It's like always kind of sprinkled into another paper because actually publishing that highlights it too much. Like they don't want to highlight the fact that ocean levels were super acidic in the Devonian just based off of like what we know about the oceans today because they don't want to get in the way of this narrative of like every shell animal is going to go extinct because of ocean acidification just because some, you know, zooplankton or some larva are, are expressing, expressing thinner shells. I'm like, yeah, you get ammonites, the most robust shelled creatures ever to exist on planet earth appearing when ocean levels are four, to, four times more acidic than they are today. So it's rough, dude. It's, it's rough to sit here and listen to this day in and day out. But you know, even though I'm taking classes, like I, I at least like, like that the classes are objective. But the students, like the actual peers I'm going to have, as well as many of the professors, especially the more tenured professors, sticks up the asses of all of them, man. Yeah. So even if, because I'm, I'm, I'm remaining completely objective. So if you believe in intelligent design, if you believe in creationism, that is no less valid. That is as equally valid as the idea that everything came about randomly, if not more so. It takes just as much belief. And my mother said this to me when I was a child. My mother does not agree with me politically. She's very much on the left. But she told me that there is, it is, takes just as much faith. It takes as much faith in God as it does to believe that everything on earth is random. She told me back when I was a child, it takes just as much faith as faith in God to assume that the opposite is true in order to have this conviction that there is no God and that God didn't create everything. You then have to employ just as much belief and just as much, you know, preponderance of evidence as it does to believe in God. Cause I mean, like, how are you going to disprove God? And this is something that's like really just been a challenge. They've been in like challenge mode about it. They spent decades trying to find, you know, a way to create life in a lab. But they don't even realize that, like, it's it's fucking hilarious that they haven't succeeded. It's, like, absolutely fucking laughable that they haven't succeeded. But it's even more laughable when they do succeed. Because it's a damned if you do. It's a catch-21. You create life in a lab and you prove that life is intelligently designed and has to be deliberately designed. Because they always try to go to random factors. Like, oh, we're going to electrically shock this, this chemical soup to create life. Doesn't work. Like, oh, we'll, we'll have these fossil lipids. Um this fossil of viral, it'll naturally form a, a circle of RNA and it'll, then it'll start self-replicating. Nope. Doesn't do that. Oh, we'll wrap a viroid around a fossil of viral. Doesn't, doesn't work. Cause guess what? You need, you need basic enzymes, proteins. Uh, you know, you, you need chaperonins to fold your proteins for you. You need, uh, some method by which to multiply yourself. It's like, you need, um, you know, some sort of growth factor and something to induce that growth factor. I'm like, where, like, how, how does your mitogen pathways work? Like, what about the mitogen activity? What's telling the cell to grow and divide? Is that always on? Like, you're going to need ATP and GTP because you need to go through all the, all the chemical pathways that, re that revolve around that. You know, how are you going to respire? How are you going to break down stuff? Like you need fatty acid oxidization. You need the citric acid cycle. You know, you need even the most primitive archaea or bacteria needs to metabolize something. And most of these early organisms are thought, thought to be chemosynthetic. So it's like, how are you breaking down? Um, how, how are you breaking down compounds to be edible? Like what enzymes are you using to catalyze those reactions? How are you getting the activation energy? Like what input are you getting for that? 
where did the ribosome come from? Like you needed uh, ribosomal RNA to fold itself in the correct sequences and you need two major ribosomal subunits and then those need to fit together flawlessly in order to tag together. And then they need to be able to, um, you know, translate that DNA into amino acids. So you also need those, those transfer RNAs carrying those amino acids that then help link them together. And that's how you can create a new protein. You know, even fucking bacteria have ribosomes and need ribosomes to create new proteins. No fucking primitive life on earth can exist without a ribosome. That needs to appear at the same time as everything else. It's a phospholipid bilayer. It has to all appear like there needs to be a way uh, for endocytosis to work. There needs to be active and passive transport, which requires membrane proteins. There needs to be like an alpha helix going through like transmembrane protein that needs to happen. Like you need like, you know, mediated protein channels. You need nuclear pore. You need like importance and exportance. If you have a nucleus, those need to come from somewhere. Even if you don't, and you're just an archaea with a nucleoid, you still need uh, transcriptase. You still need kinases. You still need every single protein, every single lipid, every single amino acid necessary to create an, even the most basic of organisms. And this is something I really tried to hammer home in my abiogenesis video, but people still don't fucking hear the music. I direct people to my videos when I banter with them in, in YouTube chat because I'm a masochist, but it's like they don't fucking care. It's like they, they look at the video, they cherry pick a point and they're like, oh, well, that it's like trying to talk to these people. They're not scientists. They're not fucking scientists. Like, like it's just ridiculous. Theoretics and actual reality of things. There's concepts and there's how it actually works like practice and everything. But even here, there is factual changes about species in different animals. Microevolution is observable and testable, but macroevolution, the, the idea that animals can shape shift in, in, you know, a few thousand generations is just horse shit because the entire reason behind why they try to push these beliefs so hard isn't to find the truth. If they're obsessed about the truth, they would be picking through the shit with a fine tooth comb and constantly reevaluating, constantly coming up with new theories, even if they're cockamamie and trying to test them out, like pitching around multiple ideas and all ideas based on speculation and not the scientific method having equal weight. Clearly they do not. All of these opinions, all of these rationales that don't involve the scientific method have to be based on materialistic assumptions, i.e. that this happened randomly. There cannot be any other factor that we don't already know about. There's no factors that we don't know about. That's what I bring up the, the null hypothesis, the if-then, that if we know everything, then our models must be correct. Because we don't see that. It's like you've all your, your own experiments reject the null hypothesis. Your own experiments reject the null hypothesis over and over again. You don't know everything. You don't know all factors that are at play here. And yet you assume that only these factors are at work when you make your theories and you make your ideologies. So they act like, oh, the science is sound. But no, you're really begging the question. You're assuming that your data and that your factors are absolutely correct and that there's no other uncontrollable factors in your, in your study or in your postulation when in reality there are because it's a very observable it's a very observable test of what will reject or, or accept your hypothesis. We don't have a single model of evolution or animal change or anything that even comes close to what we see in nature. Not even the most brilliant scientist with the best supercomputer has actually created a hyper-realistic simulation of what life is actually doing. It just hasn't happened yet. And when it does, that'll be great. That'll be dope. You know, we'll see. But we're not going to get there unless we do find out which factors are also at play to get the to get the results we see in nature. And maybe you're going to have to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one. Maybe it's going to take that. But until we find those factors, we have no way of knowing. Yeah, it is anamorphs. You know, it is it is literal shape shifting on t on time scales that don't make sense. It, it is it is the idea that like shape radically shape shifting instead of just stretching or changing pre existing physiology solely due to natural selection or changing allele frequencies, we're instead going to assume it's like yeah you had a Great Dane can become a Chihuahua genetically speaking if you have enough inbreeding you can get enough homozygosity or even heterozygosity who who the fuck cares but you can get enough homozygosity to get the right traits in the right places to get your little corgi out of a wolf. Or you can just like kind of select for more wolfy traits and you won't get like some of the more German shepherdy, you know? 
but a dog's not going to become a bat. You know, a dog's not going to sprout fucking wings and fly away in 10 million years. You know, you're, you're, that's just not what we see. 10 million years ago, canids were less diverse. It's like, you know, of course, boo. But they were still canids. Like, they were still observably dogs. It's like, you know, you know you're not getting, you're not, you're not looking back 10 or 15 million years and dogs are unrecognizable. You have to go back to the Eocene, to like the earliest carnivorans to get something that you think isn't a dog. You have to go back to like, you have to go back to like the Oligocene to get like these primitive ass dogs. Like you have to go back like damn near 30, 40 million years to get like a not dog out of a dog. Even, even by their, you know, metrics, like this had to happen. The, the transition from Eohippus 55 million years ago to modern Equus is essentially a story of like a horse growing and having less digits on its limbs. And then you have the, the whales that in just 10 million years can become fully aquatic from fully terrestrial hoofed animals. So it's like, that's the inconsistency we see as well. It's like, not just that they're trying to frantically disprove all alternative ideologies, but also that their ideology isn't consistent that, you know, you pick and choose what's a homoplasy and what's, you know, and what's a synapomorphy. It's a convergent evolution when it behooves you. And it's, it's a, an example of shared descent when it does. And it just pisses me off. Like you'll, you'll point to convergences all the fucking time. You'll point to homoplasies all the fucking time, but only in examples where it doesn't fit your, your phylogeny, where it's conflicting with the data and you're like, well, if it conflicts with the data we collected, obviously the problem is with this fundamental concept and not with our data collection or not with the, the way we're seeing things. So that's what's going on. It's like, on one hand, you have living fossils. And on the other hand, you have radically shape-shifting creatures. And it's just, and it's just like, okay, how, how is it good? Well, what's good for the goose, not good for the fucking gander? How is it that these concepts remain intact and, you know, sensible for some organisms but then for others, you just go off the fucking crazy train. And because we dig up a bunch of fossils, you think like, well, obviously there has to be this progression somehow evolutionarily uh, throughout these clades to explain this away. Because if it doesn't, what does it mean? All life has to have a common origin, first and foremost. Every phylogenetic tree has to feed into it. But at the root of that tree is not intelligent design. It's not panspermia. It's not, you know, xenobiosis or whatever. It's just straight nothingness. That life came from nothing. Everything we see is random. Everything we see is from this chaotic process of change. Life has no meaning. Everything is mechanical. It's like that is what is going on. It's a deliberate attempt to kill spirituality, religion, and critical thought in the minds of scientists. Something that's never been in science. Every early scientist from Antoine Lavoisier to Isaac Newton to Max Planck were all religious. Einstein talked about God even though he was an agnostic, still talked about God. It's like, you can't divorce spirituality from science. Earliest mathematicians, earliest astronomers, earliest everybody, all of them were, were religious people. All of them saw science as a branch of philosophy, and all of them saw philosophy as a branch of spirituality. It is something you cannot divorce from science. And to deliberately try to kill spirituality and science is to kill the critical thinking necessary for it. That's why stagnant, you know, stagnant fucking replication crisis bullshit is so ubiquitous these days why science is basically halted in its tracks in multiple areas of the field because it's like you're not really discovering anything if you ever knew how stagnant biology was as a field you would never fucking study biology there's eight times fewer jobs for biologists than there are for people holding biology degrees and my degree is literally two-thirds women and it's just like one of these things where it's like you know it feels like adult fucking daycare like taking classes that really are are meant to prepare you for the world and instead, it's like this hand-holding fucking quiz-taking bullshit. And you just realize that not a single one of these people is going to walk away with a degree that prepares them to actually do science, to actually be decent fucking scientists. And just the idea that you have to go through the mill of, of, of academia to become informed and intelligent and critically thinking is just a farce. And sometimes I feel like I almost regret my decision. I don't. I, I really don't. And once I walk away from academia, I'm doing it basically forever. I am going to try and teach. But the thing is, is that I just, I'm not in love with academia. But yeah, so, so like, 
it's it's a thing where it's like they really don't if every time it rankles them when people like me rear their ugly head and point out the holes in their theory it really rankles them. they want their theory to be accepted as fact they want it to be like a law like gravity they want everybody to accept macro evolution due to an overwhelming preponderance of evidence and the evidence is garbage it's like everybody wants to take the case at face value but they don't actually want to dig and defend their points and when they do try to defend their points they come up against a wall which is there's a difference between what the environment, what selection decides and a difference between what random error or random gene instructions decide. It's not the same thing. And they act independently of one another and people forget that shit. They don't understand evolution and yet they will vehemently defend evolution. Something that it's like, they'll defend something you don't understand because it's not based off logic and science. It's based off of belief and, and dogma. Yeah. So breaking the spirit. So what does it mean to break the spirit? What you're trying to achieve when you divorce someone from their spirituality or divorce someone from alternative ways of thinking, you want to open them up to all the additional propaganda that you want to shove down their throat. You're more likely to be a climate alarmist if you believe in abiogenesis. It's like th this is a continuance. Like you will, you will believe in all the climate bullshit and you'll believe in the same people who want to spout it. It's like, because imagine you now have caused this person to walk away from whatever spiritual system they either believed in before or what they were brought up with. They will forever associate that system of thought with that kind of like more archaic traditional whatever system. It is not a coincidence that conservatism is, is associated with creationism. It is not a coincidence that leftism is associated with with abiogenesis associated with the science associated with all this we all saw this during covid we all saw this during the whooping cough the rice rabies whatever you want to call it where people were taking political stances based off of their trust in science and what is science you know is is it observable and testable it, are people dropping dead from from you know from heart attacks at 19 years old you know i'm, I'm observing sure as shit are testing us like the testing is sure as shit happening and what i'm observing and what you're testing is telling me it's a bad idea maybe as a young man you know i'd rather roll my dice on catching a cold than dying of myocarditis that's what's observable and testable but guess what if you're anti-vaccine you're a bigot you probably support trump you've waved an american flag you're a bigot you know if you don't believe in evolution you're a bigot if you don't think gay people should be married you're a bigot it's like it's like all it is a bigot is somebody who doesn't change their opinions and it's like is it bigotry is it bigotry to think that despite an overwhelming amount of evidence to the contrary you're still gonna think that you're better than people who may not agree with you it's like you really think that you're more right than this other person just because you think you have the answers like yeah i have the answers to everything we got it figured out gg we don't need science anymore but you say all the time too these same people one of the great things about science is even when we're wrong we're right even when we're wrong we're right because science is always changing and adapting but guess what's not changing and adapting guess what's not changing and adapting your dogma is not changing and adapting you will never i guarantee this shit like market clip it they will never in a century from now, they will never change their stance on abiogenesis. We could keep experimenting, keep proving this shit wrong, rejecting the null hypothesis over and over and over and over again. It's like the gay gene until Berkeley finally admitted we couldn't find it. They're still looking for that motherfucker still because they can't take being wrong. They cannot take being decisively proven wrong about anything. The science is not in support of abiogenesis. The science is not in support of shape-shifting animals in 10 million years. It's not. And they can't accept it. They are so in fucking denial that their pet theory, their ideology, does not hold up to scrutiny. They fucking hate it. They hate when people like me come out and point this shit out. They say, oh, you're ignorant. You don't know. Sh Again, say you're against evolution in any chat. They will call you an ignorant, mouth-breathing retard. They will they will think you were the most troglodyte, like, motherfucker, most uninformed, like, super, oh, you don't know shit. You're just a fucking peasant, whatever. 
and then you actually bust open the can of worms and they're just like, well, actually, well, actually. And then they'll actually give you a, a, an actual point. They, they'll, they'll go off on this tangent. Well, environment and natural selection, they, you know, they do induce the genome. It's like, do they though? Do they, do they induce the genome to randomly mutate? They don't. That, that, if that's what you're asking, it doesn't. No amount of natural selection is going to induce a mutation. Not going to happen. That's, like, that's fucking Lamarckism. We know it's bullshit. So it's like, is natural selection or adaptive radiation or niche openings going to induce mutation? I don't fucking think so. So what's going on? How is this happening? Again, random gene mutation is your answer. And yet you're coming at me with all this extra bullshit like the cause isn't that. You say it's that. Like literally, I'm using your tools and your logic. I'm playing your game. I'm showing, I'm not throwing a football at the soccer match. You know, I'm not throwing bocce balls at the pool table. I'm playing your fucking game and pointing out with your fucking logic why this is bullshit. Is that a crime? Like, is, is that somehow like, does that somehow not cross streams? I don't get it. I don't, I don't fucking get it. So that's that. I don't know. It it kind of it kind of blows my mind. Like we look at the Devonian, we look at all these periods, and this is the Devonian. We have the Carboniferous, we have the Permian, and then we're moving into the Mesozoic with the dinosaurs. But these are the these are the periods. I think after the Devonian, especially, we get into kind of like whack job territory where it's like a lot of the same points reiterated, but in completely different areas. Like the Carboniferous is going to be the place where a lot of changes happen to the earth and where a lot of things are assumed, especially how it ended, especially about what came afterwards. It's a lot. It's a lot. The assumption that insects were giant just because of oxygen levels, their trachea couldn't support their breathing. Like I'm going to get into that and how much like assumption that takes because Again, it's like, you know, you think random gene mutations, alleles, like some peristaltic motion in the trachea and bada bing, bada boom, they'll stay big. But no, it's a fundamental limitation to insect morphology, even though they came onto land by fundamentally altering their physiology. So they can alter the physiology enough to get on land, but can't alter it enough to stay big. Like riddle me that. So that's, that's what I'm going to cover next time for, uh, for this it's just like the inconsistencies of their fucking logic just never cease to amaze me that the the evolutionist take on nature is probably and this is what i kind of like to do it's so fucking incoherent that it's like when you when you pay attention from clade to clade you get completely different pictures than when you look at other clades you're like oh well it's completely different like these animals share the same in fucking environment these animals came about with certain means you you say the impetus for these animals to come onto land was so great they're going to radically change their physiology but then they can't change their physiology enough to stay large and competitive in their ecosystems once they're on land like they're in some kind of stasis where their trachea can't fucking adapt to i don't know like pump a little bit more air or absorb a little bit more oxygen they're gonna go through enough allele changes to go from having gills to trachea but can't go through enough physiological changes to go from trachea to more efficient trachea that's what's being purported here. So it's like, that's more or less the take I'm going to have in the Carboniferous. Like once we get there, I'm going to mostly point out inconsistencies and kind of start with that. Like the inconsistencies, like the emergence of reptiles uh, from amphibians and like the actual genomic differences between reptiles and amphibians. I'm going to point that shit out. It's like the assumption that amphibians are more primitive than reptiles pointing that shit out. You know, stuff like that. It's like kind of really baseless assumptions that it's like fish to amphibian and amphibian to reptile. It's like, yeah, bro. Like that's something I'm going to cover uh, for next time. For now, though, I'm going to kind of pivot. I guess like with the remaining amount of the stream, I might go to like two hours. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I don't know, some life stuff. Like I'm changing jobs currently, like in the process of that. Um I'm kind of going through uni. I have a date next week. You know, things are happening in, 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 in the life of the fro. The fro is undergoing large personal growth. But uh, yeah, it's, it is ego investments. 
So like when we look at our own egos, like when we, when we actually audit ourselves and realize like none of us are perfect and have things that we can work on. Well, we kind of come to realize like, I don't know. So I, I, I don't know if I'm going to talk about this that much, but like when I did my, my sex quest, when I did my, you know, video, I guess the sex quest video, the, the main thing I kind of was trying to set out to do was kind of like hit the same vein that I was hitting when I was on Drex's stream, like hitting the same vein of trying to understand human sexual behavior from zoology and ethology. And what we get and what I got and what the point I got to when I was researching more for that was human behavior and animal behavior and the behavior of all organisms is not random. Like even though it's, it's affected by multiple factors, the element of randomness that we perceive in animal, personal, whatever behavior is still something going on. It's still happening behind the scenes. Like when, when Jung and Freud talked about the subconscious, talked about the subliminal little cues that we get and aren't even aware of, we realize that human observation and detection is the primary method by which we understand the world. It is not the noumenon. It is not what Kant says is the ultimate truth. Instead, it's a fixation on the phenomenon. It's a fixation on that which we can observe and readily test. But just like with, you know, which just like with the with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, your actual observation of an event affects its results. You can't observe a particle's momentum and relativistic velo uh, velocity at the same time. It's like its position and its velocity and its and its relative momentum can't be understood simultaneously I believe that's how it goes so it's like you know i can I, I can't tell what this particle is but i can kind of tell how fast it's going and it's like yeah and it's doing all this weird shit and it's like we go to a quantum level and like literally we don't even know if what's happening is legit or just an effect of our you know observation this is a particle or a wave and so it's like there's always been that philosophical aspect of science that makes it a bit wonky. And that's how life is. Like we can try to make deliberate decisions about life that affect things. We can try to like live life by certain sort of rules. There's always going to be things out of our control, things we have to take ownership over and things that we like, you know, have to move and shake about. But we can't get like deterred by too much because there's always going to be people out there who want to fucking break you down and hate. But it's like, you got to think, you got to think about this shit. You got to think about like the, the materialists and, and the globalists and all these kind of different people, the same way you think about your own life. you got to understand there's powers that be that want you to act, think, and go a certain way in your life. that want you to essentially be pawns in their machine. And that's what academia taught me, but also real life. Like there's people, you know, there's, there's women who will try to manipulate you for your materials. There are, you know, colleagues that'll try to like buck air crabs, you trip you up so that they can remove competition. And like, I just recently with the job, I, I just left, I'm sw I switched jobs with the job. I just left. Like, you know, it was a typical thing of trying to silence a whistleblower because like the head manager had connections in HR. And I'm like, look, like where I was working was an armed robbery waiting to happen. I think I said on my like last chop up kind of talked about how unsafe I felt there and all that. I pull that shit up. I address it. And it's like, you know, there's things that happen in life that are out of your control it's like and but you have to make decisive drastic decisions when i first made this channel to kind of tell people about evolution to trying to educate people about evolution what i realized is that ironically the main people trying to push evolution trying to do this are the people the most uh, like misunderstanding the most vile and the most you know deliberately propagandistic concerning evolution of anyone they don't objectively teach this subject they teach it from a lens of you know anti-spirituality or anti-critical thinking they want you to think exactly what they think they want you to believe exactly what they believe based on data that does not support what they're claiming based on findings that assume and beg the question and it's really tragic it's really tragic thinking about how many people how many kids how many folks march and fall into step because they're bamboozled and and mesmerized by the amount sheer amount of data sheer amount of evidence they have for this thing but ultimately what they don't have is a coherent line of thought concerning it and when i break down history 
when I break down how they use comparative anatomy, how they use base mutation rate, how they use changes in the legal frequency of modern animals, microevolution and processes, we don't see a lot of that. And one thing I didn't touch on today concerning these animals, these transitional species, is outbreeding depression. If you breed with a, a creature that has radically different alleles than the alleles that your niche belongs to, let's say you do have a novel mutation that helps you, you know, walk better on land. What if that's, you know, a, a, an allele that's also detrimental to how you function in water? What if it doesn't give you a competitive edge in breeding, but only a competitive edge in acquiring food? Then sexual selection is going to BTFO you. Or genetic drift is, and then, you know, fuck genetic drift, you're genetic drift in your ass right into oblivion. So it's like, you even look back at like fundamental principles in microevolution, like outbreeding depression or genetic drift, and you already see examples of why magical shape-shifting cartoon animals doesn't really pan out in 10 million years. Why you can't go from Eustonopodon to Tularpodon in 10 million years. Because you don't see that in nature. It's like the things that are actually observable and testable are not being observed and tested. They're being ignored. Louis Pasteur's experiments and every experiment past that, trying to you know see where life comes from, is it spontaneous generation or not? And they will literally sit there and say, a abiogenesis is not spontaneous generation. Then what the fuck is it then? If it's not spontaneous generation, then what the fuck is abiogenesis? It is a singular incident of spontaneous generation. Even if it happens once, even if it's just one time. Oh, it's not spontaneous generation because it didn't happen all that. No, even if it's one time, it's still spontaneous generation. And you say that spontaneous generation can't happen because you will fully support the Louis Pasteur experiments. One of the most peer-reviewed studies in history. It's peer-reviewed every time somebody boils water to purify it. Because they know no animals are going to pop up in my chicken noodle soup if I boil this shit and seal it up. Every time. It's one of the most observable, testable, repeatable experiments ever ever in human history and all of science and all of cell biology one of the most sturdy longest lasting successful experiments ever is the louis pasteur boiled chicken flask experiments chicken soup boiled in a flask and sealed will never ever 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 produce life no bacteria will grow that it will never spoil beyond the natural degradations of of the particles within there based on chemical processes the, those chicken flasks are still sterile. But you're going to sit here and deny that because your ideology makes it to where you have to find a common origin for all life and life can't have an intelligent origin. So we have to make it come from randomness, even though the actual science doesn't support it. So what we're getting today isn't science. People need to understand that it's not science. It's like, it's like calling leftist liberals. You're not calling them libs. It, calling them libs doesn't make any fucking sense. These people aren't liberal. They're leftist. It's the same thing with these folks. They're not scientists. They're not fucking scientists. They're priests. They're priests in a cult of materialism. And they're not, they don't give a fuck about the science. They don't give a fuck about the scientific method. It's like they all want to be like Carl fucking Sagan or Stephen fucking Hawking. It's like they don't want to actually tout science. They want to tout their ideology. And all these cucks, all these, all these science, you know, connoisseurs just follow in lockstep without even thinking for a minute like oh does that make sense how does natural selection you know play a role in how mutation works you know just a little bit of brain cells i'm not fucking nostradamus i'm not albert einstein it is not a massive leap of logic to, to figure out what's going on if you actually study the subject but why am i alone why am i here why am i you know making these streams and making these videos the way I am because it's not, I don't hear it anywhere. I don't hear it anywhere in fucking YouTube. In fact, I feel like YouTube doesn't even, it's like, I bet there's more channels like me out there, but nobody fucking actually watches it. But I look for them. I look, I scour YouTube and all I find are really mainstream voices bringing up really good points, but always trying to, to like, always trying to like have this civil back and forth between people really fucking intense back and forth between folks who just don't they just don't fucking get it they don't get that what they believe is a belief they're so convinced it's the science but how is it scientific to reject 
the Pasteur experiments? How is it scientific to look at massive radiation in the fossil record and blame random mutation for it? In just 3 million years in the Carboniferous, you get almost every single life plan that you ever see. Such radical changes to the genome in such a short amount of time, even, even by modern standards. Humans changed less in the last 250,000 years than they changed in the 250,000 years before that. And, you know, and those changes themselves, like Heidelbergensis to humans, not that drastic. Like still, so it's like a Neanderthal. It's like, you know, I can still see what's going on here. But in a similar time frame in the, in the Cambrian, you're already getting animals diverging and experimenting with body forms that it's just ha like, ha how? Like, seriously, how? Like, how is this happening? Like, what's the actual scientific explanation? Oh, well, well, you know, it's a long amount of time, you know? You know? I'm like, but does the data support it? Does the base mutation rate of organisms at any time in history that we see in nature even remotely support that amount of speed? Nope. So the Cambrian explosion from the very get-go is something people have always been bashed on. Like, how the fucking animals mutate fast enough to keep up with the with the rate of change? People have asked that since the start. You're like, you can look that up on, on YouTube. There's tons of people making content pointing out these things. I'm just making it more coherent by focusing on a period to period. People make these big ass fucking PowerPoints and badger on and on with a fucking PowerPoint. It's like no one wants to see that shit. They want a coherent argument for why what these people are saying doesn't make as much sense as what is actually going on. It's like it makes so much more sense to think critically and understand, okay, this is how this shit's actually happening rather than accepting what the fuck there is because otherwise you're just going to be confused and just trust the science, bro. I know it doesn't make sense but because it, it's concrete. It's like it's not fucking complicated. It's life. Yeah, it's, it's complicated in the sense that it's hard to understand, but what's going on is not. It's like these people have what they're trying to push. And if you don't go along with them, then you're a fucking idiot. And they treat you like a fucking idiot. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 the truth. And if I ever did, I'm not going to, like, no thesis. You have to defend a thesis. And just letting you know, th this is why academia is cucked. Nobody is going to, like, if you defend this thesis, they will never pass. It's like, you can point out how bullshit this is from the bottom to the top. You can you can write the most fucking god tier dissertation on this topic, and trust me, from other scientists who've gone through the same shit, who who you know made PhD dissertations on you know the likelihood of there being intelligent design, they never get anywhere. They they will not give you your PhD. They will the panel will deliberately decide that you are an ignorant fucking idiot, and that panel is not unbiased. That panel has a lot of fucking bias to it. They they will absolutely refuse to give you a PhD if you make your thesis on this. I'll have to I'll have to make a thesis on fucking, you know, the marsupial mole or some shit because there's no fucking way in hell I'll ever get I'll ever I'll ever get any letters after my name producing a thesis that talks about how retarded fucking evolution is. It'll it'll never happen. Or macroevolution, I mean. Like I'll, it'll never happen. Like the the likely the likelihood of abiogenesis being a thing based on Louis Pasteur experiments, maybe, maybe. I mean, you're, there's always that chance, but you know that's probably what I would do if I was to do a thesis on anything. It would be the likelihood of abiogenesis and just how likely it probably wouldn't happen. I wouldn't focus on anything really else because a critique. I'm not trying to test anything. The only thing I'm trying to do is use their own tools, their own logic and twist it against them because they want to have these lines of logic and reasoning that are inconsistent. That that'll happen like I said, homo plays you for me, but not for thee. We're going to decide what's a shared trait, what's a derived trait. You know, we're going to we're going to formulate this to where it works with what we think the universe should be like. That's, it's just a bunch of begging the question. They start from an assumption and build everything backwards. They don't actually try to find the truth. They want to start with the conclusion and work their way back. And that's what you see all the fucking time. Everything has to have a common origin. They start at a place and work it back. Like, what did this come from? And then what did this come from? That came from that, that came from that. Ultimately, it came from this one organism around a volcanic vent. And that came out of fucking swirling, swirling water that's mineral rich in a fossil lipid bilayer uh, 
formed and consolidated around a, a bunch of nucleotide bases, and that became the first life. That's what they want you to think. Like, dude. And I cons and I did bring up earlier, it's like, yeah, dude, this is like the fucking cat. They, they act like the Catholic Church. Like, try to be a bishop without like getting consent for the church. It's all cronyistic bullshit. Try to get a university teaching position, cronyistic bullshit. Someone puts in a word for you, they it's like when you realize how much schmoozing, how much politicking, how much ass kissing goes into being an academic, you'll never want to be an academic. Nobody would ever want to be a scientist. They knew what their fate was going to be as a scientist. They wouldn't do it. It's like realize what you're going to be. It's like you think you're going to be out there like looking after animals. You will be lucky if you get the grant money to do that once every five fucking years. Motherfuckers act like that's a regular part of their job. That I'm just going to go out and I'm going to go on this expedition and go on that expedition. Maybe, I mean, if you're lucky, you'll have it like once a year. Maybe once a year you get to do that. The rest of your time, you're going to be spent behind a fucking desk. Writing, teaching. It's, fun. It's, it's like that's what your life's going to be because they don't want you to step out of line and do anything controversial. You'll lose your, your tenure track. They'll fire you because they think you're not playing. You're not a team player. You have. It's like everybody who steps out of line in academia gets silenced, gets shoved under the fucking rug forever. They will like discredit you. It's like, dude, it's fucking Game of Thrones tier. Like it's I hate fucking talking about like pop culture references or media. But it's like, it's cutthroat as fuck. It's like people act like this is some shit where it's like, just because you get letters after your name and you pass some tests, you know, now you're an academic. It's like, dude, no, no. It's like, I would rather just, my dreams don't include being tied to these people. I used to think like, oh, I'm going to go for all the, all the letters and by my age, I'm going to like do all, it's like, no, dude, I fucking went to another country. I learned another language. I pursued other interests. I wasn't going to spend my entire fucking life just being assigned, just following those people's footsteps. I'm like, I, I looked at Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm like, maybe I should just become a fucking wildlife photographer and save myself some fucking time. Because it's exactly what I would have done anyway. Going out to remote places around animals and taking photos. Like, probably would like that more, to be fucking honest, than whatever's going on now. But yeah, dude. I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, hear you're doing well. But it is stagnant, bro. Like, this, this shit's right. Like, it, it is stagnant because stagnant, it's like you need creativity. You need creativity to drive science forward. But because of cronyism, because of favoritism, because labs are grooming people to fill certain shoes, there's a lot of the replication crisis. Like the fact that many public scientists, like many of these things published are not replicable. Or they have really small sample sizes. Or their, their margin of error values and their final results are fucking huge. And it basically nullifies the experiment. Like you have, you have some experiments where the margin of error for data overlaps so strongly with the other data points that the fucking trend line is not even consistent across the data. You have like two different fucking trend lines. And then you have like, oh well the trend line's there. I'm like, really dude? Like you're gonna you're gonna sit here with margin of error that overlaps so much that it makes your data damn near incoherent. Even when you plug that shit into Excel or R, you're getting like almost a different result every single time and you're gonna say you have conclusive results. Like I go through studies that have assumptions, errors, biases, like you go through enough papers, have enough of that shit assigned to you, and you start to notice some patterns. I mean, luckily I had um, a really good e ecology professor who really pointed out in many studies, like th this study has this and this error, this study makes this and this assumption, this is based off this metadata, which is not replicable and was had a sample size of this. It's like when you actually take a paper and dig deep into it, you see very very, very clear issues with how many people are getting on with how they do their research. And you clearly understand that a lot of it is comes down to, you know, students or academics using students to basically be lab techs for them. It's like, you're going to, as a PhD student, you're a lab tech. It's like this, you're, you, you could easily go out in industry with a, with a master's degree, become a middle management, something in corporate and probably have a more fulfilling life than whatever the fuck they're doing with four years of your fucking life in, in a PhD pro. Remember four years of your fucking life. Some people spend half a decade in their PhD and that's all you're doing. That's all you have time to do. Half a decade of the best years of your life spent being somebody's bitch in a lab with just the vague hope that you'll get letters after your name. So you can spend all your time writing fucking articles and maybe getting enough grant money to do something interesting once in a while. 
that's your life as a PhD. That's what that's the dream that they saw these kids. They think you're gonna be out like Steve fucking Irwin wrangling animals. But Steve Irwin got his fucking degree. In fact, I don't even think he ever got his degree. It's like motherfucker was just out there wrangling animals. Like, just go outside, touch grass. It's like, do I need this shit to, to work with animals? Do I need this shit to to be taken seriously as a scientist? Because I wouldn't be taken seriously as a scientist anyway. Get those letters after my name, say that Mac Revolution's a crock of shit. And guess how many people are going to give a fuck about the fact that I'm a PhD? They'll think I'm a fucking kook. It's just like, yeah, and, and because the Council of Jedi it is a perfect analogy of cronyism. How did Anakin become a master Jedi? You know, how the fuck did all that even happen? It was all a bunch of like, oh, this guy's like the chosen one being groomed for this position and then shoved into the role before he was ready. And the way he was treated, despite having the skills, he still wasn't seen as an equal. See? So it's like they know – and because George Lucas is not some fucking visionary saint. He's not showing you something that's that hard to think about. He just explained a typical cronyistic, nepotistic system. And the reason it's stagnant is because it's not based on merit. It's not based on who does the best research, who does the best – you know, who, who writes the best articles, who does the most thorough work. It's written purely based on who is the most, whose ideas do we like the best? That's why you hear about scientists who are lost in like the throes of, of obscurity, like Nikola Tesla, and only really appreciated later on. And Nikola Tesla is not even a good example. He had a claim while he was still alive. There's scientists today that, you know, are groundbreaking, have offered huge insights into science and were completely unappreciated in their day. Like, I think Antoine Lavoisier is probably the most tragic. Like, he was fucking beheaded uh, during the French Revolution. That guy was not taken seriously at all. It's like, you know, many of these scientists only get a claim, even historically, only posthumously. This is not a new thing in science. Science acts like, you know, it was so pure for the longest time. I'm like, a lot of scientists, the best scientists, man, were the people who were breaking the mold. It was always those people. It was always the people who were the least orthodox, the ones who said, like, nah, watch this. Those were the people. Those were the people who we now look back on as the, as the giants and the greats. But many of their peers thought they were fucking idiots. The only difference is you could have a difference of opinion in academia back then and still get somewhere in academia. You're not dealing with a bunch of fucking politicized bullshit where if you express an opinion, you're being ostracized, refused jobs and positions. It's ridiculous. You couldn't imagine like the discrimination going on in modern universities it's like if they just think you don't march in lockstep for some reason you will get denied tenure even if you're on tenure track like oh no tenure for you or we find another position it's like real if you find out how schemey and smarmy and fucking absolutely cutthroat this shit is again you'd never try to be an academic you'd get your degree and go off into industry immediately so it's like you you gotta i don't know yeah most people are waiting to die like, they're just dead people walking. Like, and the reason, oh, God, I guess they're congested in this room. The only reason he says that, so the reason he says that people waiting to die is because they don't actually want to achieve self actualization. They just want to remain content in their little pocket and stay there like a big fish in a little pond, except the pond is a puddle. They just want to be a king on, on a hill. That doesn't achieve anything for them in, inside. They're like, yo, I'm fine being a pawn. I'm fine just being a fucking cuck and, you know, sitting in my chair waiting for some scrap of funding to allow me to actually do what I want to do. It's like they lose the dream that they set out for. I want to work with animals. So instead of going to a wildlife center, instead of going and, you know, getting involved with conservation or rewilding techniques and shit, they just like let themselves just get ground up in the jaws of academia oh, i have an article to write i have a class to teach and next thing you know it's like what have you fucking done with your career bro it's like you instead of doing what you actually wanted to do you spent your entire career chasing clout and trying to get an animal named after you instead of actually achieving something meaningful for the rest of humanity congratulations you were able to name a beetle after fucking barack obama congratulations you you named a fungi after spongebob fucking square pants you know it's like is that really your legacy is that really what you're doing with your life? Like you really think you're achieving greatness by doing this dumb bullshit, trying to split giraffes into seven different subspecies and shit because you want to get more funding for more expeditions to look at giraffe dicks. It's like, 
that's what modern academia has become. And I, I know it's a harsh view. Many people say it's like, oh, well, that's only because like, oh, you you wish you were a master's degree or PhD, whatever thing, or you you wish you were, you know, the, the big daddy professor or something. It's like, I don't. It's like, I one thing I want to expressly display is that I do not fucking envy these people. Let the record be clear as this stream is wrapping up. I don't envy these professors. I don't envy these talking heads. I don't envy any of these people who are unable to talk for themselves and are so dogmatic and so close-minded, they refuse to even entertain alternate viewpoints. I don't care how Chad tier scientist you are. If you're so fucking ignorant that you can't even acknowledge someone else's viewpoints, using tools, concepts, and ideas from your own fucking theory to do so, then I don't envy you. You're a dead man walking. You're a fucking walking corpse. You're like a zombie that smells like Axe body spray. You don't actually have anything going on in your fucking head because you're completely programmed. Why would I be jealous of normie sheep that spent the best years of their life throwing it away and pissing it away in academia? Pissing it away, going for degrees that will get them nowhere in fucking life. Well, I'm going to be moving and shaking, trying to achieve actual self-actualization true self-actualization, you're going to be languishing away doing what? Doing what? Learning about the same shit over and over again, but this time with this professor's take or that professor's take, telling, studying the things that they want you to study, doing the research that they want you to research. Your entire life, from the time you walk into your first class in your bachelor's to your, to your defending your dissertation as a PhD, you're being groomed and pipeline the entire fucking way, not to mention gouged for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for your effort. It is beyond cucked. Even if it was completely free, it would be cucked. But the fact that you're also paying astronomical amounts of money that you somehow have to pay back on a teacher's income, that's the shit that really fucking gets to me. It's why all of these people are like, oh, well, the left is a dollar. Oh, fucking debt forgiveness, this and that. It's like, this is why they hop on that shit. Because how are you going to pay back $250,000 of debt on your like fucking $25,000 a year stipend. Motherfuckers sitting here with the fucking stipend making less than they would make as a full-time manager at Walmart talking shit. Like they know something like they're like, they're fucking excellent. It's like, no dude, I respect a homeless man on the street more than you. If that guy can think critically about shit, take a, pick a position on something and actually think it through. But again, they look down on people that you know, that's, that's their bread and butter. It's like, oh, we're better than you. We're smarter than you. We know more than you. And they fucking don't. We all know doctors that are dumb pieces of shit, but they took the bar. I mean, they took the, uh, the MCAT and all their medical exams, you know, you know, dumbass lawyers, they fucking took the bar and passed. So they're lawyers now, you know, I'm a notary public. I, I fucking took my notary public exam. Does that make me better than someone who's not a fucking notary? Like, I don't care how many years it's like, I could have studied for 10 years to become a notary, which is, not you know practical at all it's like but even if it did it's like are you now better than me because you have a wet piece of paper from an institution you know are you do your points and your logic make more sense just because you have some letters after your name does that make any fucking sense even if i was you know just some unwashed savage barbarian that could barely speak english like would i be would i be wrong just because of that if I was homeless right now, would I, would I be wrong? If I, if I, if I was, you know, five feet tall and bald, would I be wrong? Does, does it take something besides logic and facts and coherent lines of thinking to be anything, but maybe, maybe just a little bit, you know, problematic for your ideas. So it's like guys like me, they want to brush them away. Say I'm unscientific. Say I'm ignorant. Say I'm missing the point saying i you know you don't like don't know what i'm talking about you know they'll, they'll come in watch my content for two seconds try to dislike my videos or whatever then come back to the comment sections these armchair biologists in these comment sections and then continue to banter with me like they have any legs to stand on once i btfo whatever main point they were trying to make it's just funny to me so like as the stream close out closes out on the devonian i didn't even talk about like jawed fish I didn't even talk about like how, you know, gill archers morphosed into fucking jaws and how teeth came from scales migrating there. You know, it's like I could have I could have talked about so much shit in this Devonian episode, but instead I get caught up on what people say and like what people have told me 
in the comment sections of videos and in my own threads. And it just like, it just highlights the fact that it's like, it's not even going to, it's not even that hardcore. It shouldn't even be that hardcore of a video. Like I can make my point pretty concisely with just some major key factors that people constantly talk about. It just makes me realize how fucking easy it is to actually BTFO their arguments when you get down to the nitty gritty. Like, why do I have to pick up or the, oh, about the high ode one jaw, jawbone formation from Gil Arches? Like, why does that even have to be said? If we already know that magically shape-shifting cartoon animals are a crock of shit, it's like, I can keep bringing up examples of that, and I probably will, in the Carboniferous, just to keep reiterating the point. But it's like, how many examples do I have to, do I have to show you that poke holes in your ideology? Like, I called this shit the Devonian doldrums because, like, this isn't supposed to be a positive update video. Like, this is this is directly... I'm, I'm trying to fight against a large amount of propaganda that's become ubiquitous in science. A, a type of dogma that's, you know, no different than the religious dogma. It's like, you know, Christians getting murdered by lions by Rome. I'm like, you know, maybe not as intense as that. Like, I'm not going to say I'm being fucking crucified or anything. But... Yeah, but it's like the mark between a normie, a normie and, and the red pill is just the pursuit of truth. Do you pursue truth? Or do you pursue reason and lines of reasoning above all else? A normie is someone who accepts life at face value. You want to know what a normie is? Somebody who conforms, who accepts everything just as it is the way it is and relies on other people. A normie is someone who goes with the flow of the rest of society. They won't think. They won't question. They won't try to seek out answers for themselves. If you can think critically, you're automatically not a normie. And, pe and you people, ever, even normies will hear that and be like, oh, I think critically. Do you? Do you actually question the shit that you hear? Do you actually think about the things that you say in relation to other things? I mean, I know for a fucking fact, normies will say, like, well, I think about things. I'm like, you do. Like, what do you exactly, what do you, what do you think, what, what's your most controversial opinion? Like, I'm sitting in a, in a pool table at this Halloween party listening to a dude talk about how Bill Gates and Soros are good billionaires. And that Donald Trump and, like, who like Jeffrey Epstein are bad billionaires and shit. It's just like, you, you have people who think that they're thinking. But I'm like, what makes a billionaire good? Like, what cutthroat ass billionaire out there can be actually quantified as a good person? And what makes somebody good? It's like, that is critical thinking. Like, the who, what, when, where, why, and, you know, who gives a shit about everything in your life. People don't question life. People don't question anything anymore. They take so many things, they, they hold their opinions so fucking close to their chest they can't handle genuine introspection. Like, for example, you know, many people want to go, you're a Christian, aren't you? Like, I am a Christian. But my take on God is not orthodox at all. Like, my take on God and what God is and the universe and intelligent design is not what people think it is. And I typically don't even express that on this channel. I don't even want to be it, have it be like something people pick apart. Like, oh, you're only making these videos because you're a creationist or because you're religious. I'm like, no, I'm making these videos because you're full of shit. And you keep acting like you have a better take than I do when you don't. That's what I'm trying to point out. That it, it doesn't matter if you believe in reincarnation. I don't, I don't care if you think life was, you know, if, if whatever life came from. Intelligent design, panspermia, and abiogenesis are all equally likely. With intelligent design probably being the most likely out of all of them. Because panspermia just kind of ignores the question it's like the big bang of life's origins like just kind of just kind of pushing it down the road like eh, i don't need to address that no oh, it came from another planet or it came from something ah eh, you know it wasn't even earth thing how are we supposed to eh, whatever and then intelligent design is like well you know we have this genome that's kind of numbered and shit and we have all this irreductible complexity and all these proteins and all these like cell functions have to be kind of already going in order to have regular cell function of even those primitive organisms. So something probably created it and left it here or, you know, spawned it, whatever. And then the other camp is abiogenesis where it just randomly came out of nothing. It's like all I'm saying and kind of like what I'm kind of pointing at, regardless, regardless is an objective thing, regardless of my own political takes, 
my own religious takes, whatever. Why is abiogenesis the best, the best origin for life? Why is it, why is microevolution the best explanation for cycles of creation and destruction in Earth's past? Why? Like, why is that? Like, why is this take the right take when you have just as much evidence and even less evidence sometimes than other people do? That's what I'm pointing out. It's like, you know, I can have my beliefs all I want. I, I could believe, I, you know, you could pull up the flying sp spaghetti monster example, whatever, but explain to me how you have more evidence for what you believe than me. Point, it's, it's, it's like, okay, life... You think it's ridiculous that life was intelligently designed. You're like, oh, fucking fairy tale, you know, fairy tale bearded man created life. I'm like, that is about as reasonable sounding as the idea that a bunch of swirling fucking seawater became life, by the way. About makes about as much fucking sense. Randomly swirling seawater versus bearded man snapping his fingers. I put them both equally in the bullshit camp. Like my my default reaction is to think that both of those theories are complete horse shit, if not for the impracticality. Like whatever created life is either the the base creator of everything we see around us, just like whatever created the modern universe also created life, or some other entity associated with the ultimate creation of the universe created whatever it is. We don't have the fucking answers. I don't think any Christian or scientist or anybody has the true answers to our past. What we were given in the Bible was purely anthrocentric. Like the Bible is a book of men. It's a book about humanity's origins, the origin of sin and the final destiny of humanity. It does not concern itself with fundamental questions like the origin of the universe. That shit is too far beyond desert nomads to grasp. The entire point of these religious texts is how they relate to people, how they relate to us, human souls, human salvation, human struggles and lineage, the story of us, our history, our, our societies, how we treat one another, how we should treat one another. The Bible's not going to tell you about the first life. The Bible's not going to tell you about these previous cycles of creation and destruction because why do they fucking matter? And even, even if they do kind of hint towards it, people forget that the point of spirituality is to ground yourself as a human being. It's to orient yourself in a way that helps you think differently about the world around you. That you aren't the center, end-all, be-all to the universe if there's something greater than you. They don't want people walking around thinking that way. Their deliberate agenda of the materialist is somebody thinking that they're, you, don't want, that you don't want these people to think there's anything more to life than what's right in front of them. There's nothing deeper, no mystery, no mystique, nothing deeper and grander behind the curtain. What you see is what you get and it's ignorant as shit. It's as ignorant as people thinking rain is God's tears. It is ignorant as shit and ignores science just as much as any other theory that you could possibly conjure up. So unscientific that I am shocked and appalled that the lack of content, lack of pushback these people have received it's ridiculous. I mean, people fight harder against transgender kids than they do against people lying to their fucking faces every fucking day pertaining to things that are settled science. People unironically sitting in chairs telling you that, oh, I know the origin of the universe and the entire universe because of entropy reactions is going to have a heat death in about uh, uh, 10 million years and the, and the sun's going to explode in 5.8 billion. People can't even predict the weather in two weeks are telling us when the sun's going to explode. Like, excuse me? Like, bro, you can't even tell me if it's going to rain or not next week, and you're telling me that the fucking sun's going to explode in exactly this many billion of years? Because you're mad? Like, fuck you. Go fuck yourself. Like, it is... That's what I'm fighting. is the hubris. Yeah. No, I don't give a fuck, dude. Like, you can't stop me from getting my degree. The thing is, is that, you know, me getting expelled would have to come as a result of, like, a flagrant violation of university policy or something. You can't, like, not let someone get their degree. What I'm talking about is, like, because I've actually shared this on um, on my, like, actual student, like, page. Like, I included a link. 
like you can't actually deny like if someone does the work you can't deny them and i actually thought i needed like a pro to do a project or something i don't but um but for like because here's the thing like you can hold these beliefs like say you're going for a master's or a phd you can hold every single belief that i have and then you know write a dissertation and then you know be a little bit cheeky with it but successfully defend it but they can't stop me from me from becoming this like they can't stop me from getting my degree it's just that no one will work with me no no one will hire me no one will put me in their labs no one will sponsor me for projects you know i won't get any funding to do shit because my peers will hate me that's what will happen it's like you can't be a lone wolf when you get a phd or master people think that they will people think like oh i'm so smart i'm like no no you're not because now your ass is chained to whatever institution is providing you funding for your work you're a indentured servant for whatever institution is funding your expeditions and funding your lifestyle as a scientist. It's like being, a, it's like they're a patron for the arts. It's like you, you now have a patron and a debt collector that you're beholden to dumbass. It's like, you know, you think that you're hot shit until Sally May is ringing up your door. Cause you owe them a quarter of a uh, quarter of a million dollars. And it's just like, you know, dude, I see academics go their entire lives and make less than fucking high school teachers even. Like they, they're so, their ego has driven them to spend their entire lives pursuing something that'll make, that makes them less money than a guy, fuck, like a, a crane operator will make twice as much in his entire life as a college professor. And these dudes will still sit around like they're better than you. But most of them now, it's like, it's becoming more and more female based. That's another thing. I talk all the time on how, yeah, I was like, you know, I, I've faced so much more discrimination as a man than I ever have as a minority, as a BIPOC, whatever. I face more, you know, people will think that I'm, you know, being hyperbolic about it because they think like there's this male privilege that exists in society for some fucking reason. But it's like you have this vague notion that, oh, yeah, modern academia is totally for it's like they have this inclusivity, intersectionality bullshit thing going on in academia. But it is, it's something that's clearly being seen, especially in my field, is that it's no longer realm of men. The only people who sign up for this shit are career women. We're fine being treated like fucking slaves because they'd rather serve their boss than serve a husband and a family. They think they think having a family is fucking slavery. But, you know, spending 25 fucking years paying off debt to a company because you want to because you like animals. It, it, that's a fucking smart idea. I'm going to spend a quarter of my fucking life paying off a degree with an income that I'd make you know, being, being like a fucking elementary kindergarten substitute teacher. And I'm going to sit here and act better than you. Cause I have a PhD with your no egg carton, no fucking, you know, your ovaries are dry as shit. It's like a lot of, a lot of these professors though, I see like they have some kids, they have a husband, but it's like, you can tell that they're not the primary breadwinner. Like you can, you can tell that they married a dude who actually has a job and something that makes money. It's like, these people aren't making shit. It's like you spend 10, 12 years in academia and you're making $55,000 a year at the most, if you're lucky, it's like you have to be one of the best professors, best educators in the entire fucking nation. Get put on it like an Ivy League school. You need to go to like a really prestigious institution, be tenured for 25 years, and then you might get like an $85,000. Like the only the most like published, I've written books, I make television, only pop scientists make anything over $100,000 without spending three decades in academia, tenure to shit. It's like when you get tenure, it's like fight for 20 years to get tenure on the tenure track. And guess what can happen? Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, uh, he, he, he grabbed me as I was walking out of lecture. And then you're, and then it's fucked. Then you're fucked for life. That's what a man, being a man is like in academia. One person, saying that yeah and it's it's like yeah i say one thing it's like i'm controversial like oh i don't um you know i i don't actually think you know there's no genetic basis for homosexuality uh it seems that homosexuality is a choice and guess what tenure track gone like that tenure track gone like that in a fucking heartbeat you say some shit like i forget that one girl she appeared on um what was it the Jocko podcast or it wasn't Jocko I think it was Joe Rogan or something 
and she got canceled. She was like, she had some take on Israel Palestine and was like, I think like, I don't know if she was pro Palestine. She took like a hard stance on it. Like she was like, she was like pro Palestine or something. And they fucking tenure track, all that fucking BTFO this chick. We launch an investigation. We found you. Da, 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 da. No further explanation, no further follow up. Straight up, dead ass, gone. Just straight up, like you're gone. Done. Like that's your career. That's your fucking career. It's like those guys who get their medical licenses revoked because someone sues them over some bullshit. It's like, yeah, 12 years of med school, gone. Just like that. But at least you're a doctor. At least you're making like $200,000 a year. You're not fucking wasting your life languishing in academia like a fucking idiot. Yeah, they they don't want to. And this is, this is a big point. And something that, you know, I don't want to simplify it like that. I know a lot of people do want to simplify it like that. But it is a lot of people. Like, I have friends that are like this. It doesn't apply to everyone. Some people genuinely just think that there's going to be some sun over the, over the rainbow. They have this idealistic view of how things are going to go for them as researchers. But really, this especially applies to, to the ladies, like people who don't want to leave school and enter real life. They want school to go on forever. And the reason I know this for sure, and I can always detect it, is because bachelor students treat fucking school like high. They treat this shit like fucking high school. It's like you're a grown ass adult i don't it's like people will call 18 year olds kids you're not a fucking child you're a grown ass adult you you got a ged or a diploma you you can work any fucking job you can vote you can join the military hopefully hold your liquor like you have no excuses like why are you acting like i give a fuck about how i think you you know Get along. It's like, no, I'm going to use logic and reason to defend my points, and you're going to cope and seethe. I don't need to get along with what's your theory for this or that is. If you can't handle other, it's like seeing, for example, when the anti abortion people come to campus, when the preachers come to campus, and people lose their fucking minds, they lose their shit. Like, oh, they can, oh, this fucking. Guys, oh, you fucking banned him from campus. Like those are people on Duke calling for like an end to free speech. It's like these people are so impressionable, so easily swayed, but they're given so much credit and so much leash because they're just young and dumb. Like motherfucker, 18 year olds fighting, you know, fighting in Vietnam, getting blown to shit. We're sent home as men and honorable and all this other shit. It's like same fucking people, same age, some people twice that age in their 40s going for a master's or PhD also out there just mindlessly like fucking chanting shit. It's just like all my, all the pain, all the pain of dealing with people who don't want to leave fucking high school, all the pain of people who don't want to, you know, accept life for what it fucking is. They don't realize that once you leave, no one gives a shit about how you think or feel. That's why they want to stay in academia. That's why, And that's why people study shit like fucking sociology or they'll study shit like gender studies. It's not that they want to like fucking actually go out and, you know, get a job working with gender. They want to stay in academia and write papers and get fucking financially supported by big daddy university patron system. That's what they fucking want because they know that they won't be able to make enough money to pay back their debt otherwise doing anything else. And if they do... They, they're not inventive enough and creative enough, ironically, to go off and actually do something with their lives. Like I tell people what I've done or what I do, and they're fucking shocked. They're like, wow, you, it's like, you know, you know, I'm older going for my degree, but it's like, bro, like, you know, I've been overseas. I've studied abroad, learned other languages. I met people from all over the planet. I've gone off and done things that have nothing to do. I've started two fucking businesses, co-founded two different fucking businesses. And it's just like the thing that fucking blows me away time and time again is that they act like that's not possible being a student. If I can do it, then I haven't even done that much compared to others. I haven't even been that lucky. It's like you have no excuse. Why do you have to – like why are you being an academic 
How does that prevent you from being more successful in general society? Why can't you go into industry? Why can't you become an entrepreneur? Why can't you expand your horizons, learn about a different subject or two? Why do you have to hem yourself into this fucking lane and all you can think and care about is just this fucking subject? You're, you're, you're living in high school 2.0, treating people like it's still fucking high school. And it's like, bro, this is real life. This is, you're an adult. You're not a 15 year old anymore. Like if you're going to sit here and gossip, it's like the amount of fucking gossiping bullshit, the amount of fucking, you know, the, the eyes like approach a group and they, you know, scoff or whatever. It's like, excuse me? Like, or like this whole thing, like, oh, I have a crush. Like having a girl tell me like, oh, sorry. I like just letting you know, like ask her to hang out. Like just letting you know I'm interested in somebody else. And I'm like, I give a shit. Why? Like you're not your boyfriend, just a guy. You're, why should I give a shit again? It's like mind blowing, mind blowing the way these people think, but you know why they think the way they do. You know why they follow along with the shit they follow along with. Every single one of them has been programmed and brainwashed to follow in a certain a certain path. And it's like, they're not there for the right reasons. They're there because they think that going to college is the right thing. And they fucking read NPR. It's like, now going to college is almost a political statement in and of itself. It's like, if you know, if you know that these people don't have your best interest at heart, if you know they're going to be fucking Nazis about wearing a mask or about making sure you're vaccinated, it's like, then it's going to push away everybody who doesn't hold that. And now universities, instead of being filled with the diversity of ideas, it's now filled with the diversity of idiots. It's a diversity of fucking mouth breathing normie NPC sheep who don't think critically about shit who don't think about what they're hearing, who all have the same fucking political viewpoints, who all spit out the same fucking bullshit about their sign. It's like, oh, you're a Libra. <laughs> I totally knew it. Like, shut the fuck up. Nobody cares. Nobody fucking cares about you or your life. If you want to engage me in, in debate on a YouTube comment section involving something that I've been studying for fucking years, then go for it. You know, if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna get into it, like, feel free. I'm always eager to engage people who challenge my beliefs and I, I change my opinions all the time. You're supposed to, you're supposed to think and you're supposed to move and you're supposed to adapt. But they instead just ironically, for as much as they accuse Christians of this shit, they want to force this horse shit down your throat. They want to force evolutionism and materialism down your throat in order to kill all spirituality you have. They want you to be a good little socialist. They want you to be, you know, fucking taking Marxism in your philosophy GEs. And when you're done, you're going to be addicted to the titty of academia. They don't want you to leave. They want to conserve all that brain power and all that talent into their fucking parasitic ass system. Convincing 17 year olds to take on 30 to $150,000 worth of debt in their first two years, just to fuck around in classes that do nothing but brainwash them. Won't take a single fucking major course for like a semester or two. And they're advised not to. It's fucking horrendous what American education is becoming. So it's like if you if we want to be Brazil because we want to cuck out to the fucking, you know, LGHTV, you know, community, whatever. And then, you know, appease communists and appease the Palestinians and Israelis. People weren't even in our country. It's like, you know, I, it, it's just ridiculous. I can't even express my own opinions or be myself because people are so brutally fucking blue pilled. And so propagandize that they literally take genuine offense to people who disagree with them. Like children. Like fucking children. They get so worked up when somebody con contradicts their dogma that they get personally offended. Like, like they're the one who came up with the idea. It is so, so ridiculous what I go through. And th this being my, my last semester in academia has never felt better. I, I just got to pass these fucking classes. I have a midterm on Monday. And it's just like, I'm just going to pass. And I'm going to look back in the, in the rear view mirror and be like, dude, fuck that shit. Like I honestly, like I have no regrets, but like I've given these people, I've given different academic institutions, some of the best years of my life. And I, I don't really want to look at it like that, but I'm like, bro, like all my teens, most of my 20s spent in academia in some capacity doing the things that I like, but I got out of academia when I've gotten out of it. And I'm not going to spend the rest of my 20s in academia. I'm not going to spend any more time training, learning, educating. It's going to be either me doing the educating and training 
or it's going to be me actually doing something with what I've learned. Because that's how people need to approach this shit. This is how people need to approach history, how people need to approach society and their lives in general. Get to fucking work, bro. Like, you know, get down to business and do something, you know, make something of yourself. You don't have to be what your fucking doctorate professor thinks you should be. You don't have to be what, you know, radical fucking leftists want you to be. You know, they want, they, I was like, I should be a victim. I should be, you know, talking about how the white man keeps me down and all this other dumb bullshit. But instead, I'm just going to take ownership for my life. I'm going to take ownership for what happens to me. And if people want to, you know, try to fuck me over, if people want to try and, you know, ha like have their final laugh or, you know, have disagreements or, you know, if they want to pull, pull strings to, you know, silence dissent, then let them, let them, let them do it. Let them try. Cause as long as you're willing to fight back that Matt, that speaks so many, that, that tells them everything that needs to be said, just the act of defiance, letting them know that the fight's not over. They can, they can bullshit 99% of people, but the fact that they can't bullshit you is a, is a win greater than you can honestly quantify. Nothing pisses them off more than looking them right in their fucking eyes and telling them you're full of shit. They hate it. They hate it. They hate it. They scoff and say, oh, well, you don't know what you're talking about. But it's like if you do and you point out very clearly and concisely all the things that are wrong with the fuck they think. They hate it. They hate logic. They hate reasoning because the more you use it, the more it points out just how fucking asinine they are. They are terrified of losing control. So the narrative and the agenda behind it is political. The cult of materialism is a political entity as much as it is a scientific entity or an academic entity. This shit's intertwined so much now with politics, they don't even try to use science to support. They use as much science as needed to not confuse students in a lecture hall. But when you actually get down to brass tacks, none of it makes any fucking sense. That's why I do this. This is why the Devonian has been so anticipated but at the same time, most of this isn't even about the Devonian. It's just about the people, the individuals who I've interacted with in the last couple of weeks, who I've noticed just don't fucking get it. This goes out to all of you who just don't fucking get what it means to be a scientist, what it means to be a critical thinker, what it means to have a scientific mind. Galileo did not have a PhD. Albert Einstein was working in a fucking post office when he wrote the theory of relativity. You don't need these fucking people. You don't need these institutions to do great things in the realm of science or to improve human knowledge. You just need creativity, insight, and the ability to methodically think out and reason what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to discover. And if you have your mind and your heart in the right place, you can achieve greatness without a bunch of political bullshit getting in the way of your academic success. Yep. Also very true. The, the amount of the amount of weaponization. I'm a protected class. I'm a BIPOC. When it makes when it makes me realize, it's like. For example, the job I just left, I, you know, I'm going to actually take, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I am going to take legal action against them. Um, but the main thing is, is like you're used and propped up as an example of how much they give a shit in diversity. What most people fully under fucking stands, they don't fucking care. You're disposable as soon as they think you're disposable. As, as soon as they can't be fucking bothered with you. You know, they'll throw you away. You know, you look cool, but if you inconvenience them, then, eh, you know. So it's, it's all a bunch of fakey bullshit. Like, that's why I've never fucking cared about race. That's why I've never cared about the victimization narrative. And why pe black people who do accept it are honestly just, that's to me a sign of like, I don't know, it's almost arrogant to think that you're, you of all people, you're so oppressed. You're so unable to achieve because of what someone else did, because of history, because of the legacy of slavery. You can't get a fucking job and you can't fucking fill out, you know, fill out, fill out any type of paperwork to get your life together. You, you can't become an entrepreneur. 
you can't get an education. You can't stay in school, get good grades. No, I'm gang banging because I never knew my dad. And I'm gang banging because, you know, I'm, I'm skipping school and dropping out of high school because of the white man. Like, shut the fuck up, dude. No one is to blame but you. You have direct control over your own fucking life. Whatever you decide to make of that, that's on you. On nobody else, not on your mom, not on your dad, not on your ancestors, not on God, not on the devil, on you. No one else but you is in control of your life. There are things that are going to be out of your control, but you have to, have to take complete and total responsibility for what your actions and decisions and your reactions are. Take accountability. Don't blame others. Don't blame the stimulus for the reaction. The reaction's your own. You're in control of the reaction. You might get a stimulus or impulse. You're responsible. I don't give anybody in academia a pass. You could easily come to the same conclusions I did. You woefully and sadly did not. So I don't respect academics who can't think critically about the shit that they hear and take everything at face value. If you don't agree in some respect, you can agree with 90% of what they put preach in the dogma. But if you don't disagree with at least some things, if you don't have some issue with what, what's being said in the narrative, then you're hopeless. You're not a fucking intelligent academic. You're a brainwashed sheep. An academic in name only. You will go through the necessary motions to maintain your ethos of credibility, but you're a hollow, empty fucking shell with nothing to contribute to science. And unfortunately, academia, just like the military, just like many other bureaucracies and institutions, is filled with vapid-headed, useless-ass motherfuckers who cannot actually genuinely contribute to shit or actively you know pull strings and do shit to get rid of people so it's like that happens everywhere that happens in the business sector as i found out it happens in academia it happens you know in families it happens in politics it's everywhere and whenever it happens we have a name for that and it's called corruption academia is fucking corrupt it feeds off of young people, feeds off of young talent, siphons as much money from them as possible, sucks that shit right the fuck up. And it's like, dude, your grant money is coming from a 17-year-old signing up for like a quarter life of debt. That's who's paying you. It's like that's it's like fucking making money off blood diamonds and still thinking you're hot shit. Yeah. And the, the red pill, I'm because people have different feelings about the red pill. I know that the red pill is nothing more than the seeking of truth. It's just the truth. It's like seeking the truth at all costs, no matter how inconvenient, no matter how hard to swallow it is. The inconvenient, hard to swallow truth, that is the red pill. It is It is what's going on. It's the matrix behind the facade. Will people get there? I think most men will eventually take the red pill. I'm convinced that most men in society, like even the guy you know, talking about how much he loves Soros and Gates. I'm convinced eventually he's going to take the red pill. He's going to graduate. He's going to go into real life and see how much people don't fucking care. He's going to realize how much of that fucking message is manufactured bullshit. And he's going to take the red pill, realize that these billionaires are all a bunch of fucking wanks. And he's going to wake up and smell the fucking coffee one day. Almost every single brutally blue pill dude I know goes red pilled. Like when I was in high school, I knew some really blue pill dudes, now red pilled as fuck, even in university. My buddy Andreas, globalist. Andreas uh, Andreas in 2016, globalist. Andreas in 2023, fucking hardcore nationalist. I, I have friends that used to be socialist, now are, you know, pretty conservative dudes financially. People who might have had really open ideas towards you know, sex work or drug use, now hardcore against both. Like, people change. People act like, you know, oh, people don't change. Like, bullshit, people change. People change. I just don't believe that people change on a, on a dime. People change over time. It's like people, someone in their 30s is not the same as the per, as not the same person as they were in their 20s. Like, me in my early 20s, 20-year-old me, and me now, you know, it's like, I'm not a completely different person. I'm still me, but I'm much more like well-informed. It's like a week of thinking now for me, I get more progress than two weeks of thinking when I was like 18, like two weeks of thinking is like two years. Like I, I've gained more in one month of introspection now, like in my mid to late twenties, you know, 
you start to mature, like your brain is developed, you know, you, you will lose out on creativity, lose out on plasticity, but in response, you have a much more well-balanced psyche, hopefully. But it's like the instability of young people, they're impressionable. I get it. But eventually when you actually do kind of settle and your brain sort of finally kind of consolidates, you're, it's, it's hopefully not going to consolidate around a mold of total bullshit. But I know people, it's like, you know, it's not the end. I know people 25, 35, 45, different opinions, different beliefs, different politics. So it's like, are you going to sit here and think, hey, oh, hopefully everybody's going to take the red pill at some point? You can't hold your breath. Like my, there's there's people like my mom who go the opposite. Like she worked in the as a prisoner for 25 years. And in her time in the system, we she went from somebody who's actually more aligned with me politically to suddenly being like somebody who watches CNN every day as a hardcore leftist. So it's like it's not that people will spit out the red pill. The red pill is something that is based on the pursuit of truth. And what people think is true, what people assume is true, that's why you got to think about it. It's why it requires critical thinking to be red pill. You can't just accept the red pill because you read a bunch of posts on the JQ on 4chan. You're not red pilled. You're just, again, you're just taking shit at face value. But to actually seek out the truth, that's what makes you red pill. And I just don't have confidence that most people in academia will ever genuinely take the red pill. I think as things get worse, as more and more positions in academia are just out of reach for most academics, you probably will see people take the red pill. You probably be like, you know, you know, fuck these motherfuckers, whatever, you know, they're, they're already halfway there, but it's just like, once they ditch the whole veil of, you know, intersectionality, Marxism, all that bullshit, then you'll finally start to see people really wake up. But it's like the political angle of it keeps them in check. It keeps them NPCs. But yeah, so it's like the blue collar, it's like the classism, there shouldn't be, this is this is one of the things that fucking pisses me off about modern America. There is no, it's like, we're not fucking Europe. Like I noticed this shit in Germany, the classism angle. It's like why I would never live in the UK. The amount of classism is retarded. You're not a different class. Blue collar, white collar, like bro, you again, you'll make more as a fucking crane operator, as an excavator, as a lineman than you ever will make being a college professor, you will make twice as much money laying asphalt as you will be. Who the fuck? Who the fuck in 2022 is going to sit there and be like, oh, well, I'm a fucking lawyer. Like, go to fucking, go to all these law tuber channels and they'll tell you all the time. But there's some fucking lawyers making $35,000 a year. Just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean you make six figures. It's the clout. It's the fucking clout. And you know what? When people when people let clout influence their opinions, it's like, okay, this guy is shit because he lays asphalt. That guy laying asphalt is making $95,000 a year after taxes. Then you have, you know, Mr. Mr. you know, public defender. I'm a lawyer. I'm a public defender for my local county making $35,000 a year. You know, one guy, he's still going to be seen as higher status than the guy making more money than him. If I'm a crane operator, and I'm making $115,000 operating this crane, I'm still going to be looked at as a bum compared to like, and it's the most bizarre thing about being a notary. Like a notary, bro, I'm just stamping and signing documents. You know, like I'm reading through them. You know, I might have to make someone sign an oath for like a, um, for like a jurat or something. But like being a notary is seen as higher. Like I don't make shit as a fucking notary. You know how spotty that work is? And like you're still seen as higher quality than somebody who's like an, a manager at Walmart making like seventy-five thousand dollars a year potentially. It's like sometimes, man, like the status is what people are attracted to. In academia, like sometimes they don't care. Like they'll bitch and moan. They're like, we need to get paid more. I'm like, do you mean? It's like so getting paid more for these professors. It's like you're already supporting an institution where people will make two hundred fifty thousand dollars for being an assistant vice minister of student affairs where you don't really do shit you'll it's like you'll let people in in the administrative positions take up hundreds of thousands of all of dollars of funding every single year to do jobs that you could replace with literal students like there's no reason these people have to even be in their positions you could just have students fill these roles and have it be part of a program or something but it's like you know you pay these people exorbitant amounts but they're not academics 
Like people forget, like these administrators are not academics. They're not writing papers or doing dissertations. These people solely want to be attached to the university titty and make just money doing not, not jack shit. Like they'll maybe send a few emails, but those people have cushy ass, very well protected jobs. And what it reminds me was like Twitter, like the full fucking Twitter acquisition, like all these people getting fired from their Twitter jobs. And they're like, Elon Musk says work for home for somebody else and like get all pissy and upset that Elon Musk lets them go. What they forget though, it's like, what service are you actually providing? You know, actually ask yourself, what service are you actually providing? Like, what is the potential reasons for your termination? And you know, it's like, you know, you have to take accountability for stuff that happens to you, sure. But at the same time, are you are you going to sit here and and promote an idea that just because someone's blue collar, white collar, just because they work for Twitter, that they are entitled to that? It's like, are you entitled to an income because your main job is banning people that don't agree with you? It's like... I don't, I don't understand where you think you're entitled to the income that you have. It's like public school teachers bitching about, oh, we don't make enough money. I'm like, you work for the county. Your money is coming from what people can pay in your local area. What you, what, what, what's the problem is, is that there's not enough teachers. If there were, if the classroom sizes were 20 kids and you're one teacher, that'll work out. You know, you're not going to bitch that much about the money that you make. You get three months of fucking vacation. You get benefits. You know, you get the whole, you get the whole nine yards. That's why I'm like actually looking at teaching. Cause I'm like, that's probably, that's actually way more stable than anything you can do in academia. First and foremost, a lot of reasons people like get a history degree, they go teach. It's like, it's a stable fucking job, but it's like a school teacher. You're, you're contributing more to the fucking community than anybody wearing a tie and going into an air conditioned room. And most teachers don't even fucking wear ties. You know, it's like they put so little fucking effort into teaching. And I'm like, you know, in Europe, being a fucking public school teacher is a prestigious, you know, position. People act like that shit's borderline blue collar now. You're like, oh, you tell people you're a school teacher and they can't, well, he's just a, just a fucking school teacher. I'm like, school teachers are making more than college professors. Like you work for a, a high school in an affluent area and you're, and most of these people, first and foremost, all do have masters and PhDs. When I when I went to high school, I, I had plenty of teachers who had the masters and PhDs. Some of them tenured, some of them making almost ninety thousand dollars a year. You can make more money being a public fucking school teacher than you'll make being a college professor for a state school. Let that sink in. Let that fucking sink in. You will have tenure, and the whole nine you will be tenured. You will be making, you know. Fat st- I've I've known teachers. Ba- it's purely based on your tax base in the local area, and this is what fucking infuriates me. Teachers constantly want to ask for more money, more money, more money, but it's like, who do you think is fucking paying you, bro? Who, where the fuck do you think your money's coming from? You're not working for a private school. You're not working for some fucking charter, this or that. You're working at a public high school pissed that you're not making the money that you should be making I'm like should you be getting paid more than a fucking firefighter should you be getting paid more than a policeman should you be should you be getting paid more than the guy who works for the county hey what's up david yeah poppy i don't know edwin has some shit to figure out bro he he, he needs to he, he has to get his shit together so it's yeah but yeah, it it is good to see the gang though. But yeah, I'm I'm kind of like I'm I'm kind of at this point now where it's like, you know, people's perceptions and what we prescribe to them. Like, does it matter what someone thinks to you if you're making more money than them? Cuz that's another thing I think about with the whole blue color white color dichotomy. Does it fucking matter? Who in whose eyes does it matter? Cuz it's like America, you could say oh, it's class like people could see with more clout, but it's like Okay, from a, let's take it from a dating angle. Let's take it from a friend's angle. Do you want to make friends with people who think you're shit if you don't have a certain type of job? Do you want to be friends with people who are so obsessed with status that you have to be in the right field to associate with them? Fuck those people. The second thing is, if dating angle, do, if you're doing this to impress women, if you're doing this because, oh, I want to find a wife that will respect... Like, are you stupid? Like, if you lead with your wallet in a relationship, that's all that's going to hold you together. The only thing holding you together is your job. You lose your job. You you have a a passing, you know, student say that you grab their butt and you're fucking fired. 
you 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 work and you're oh i'm a fucking administrator for the university and they fucking have a a, a cut or something or you you fuck up it's like dude there's so many ways that you could fuck up your life yeah see you later david yeah but there's so many ways you can fuck up your life that if you get with somebody, if you have friends or you have a, a spouse or someone you're with that doesn't respect you for you, doesn't acknowledge you for you and purely thinks of you as somebody like, oh, yeah, this is my friend, the doctor or the lawyer or whatever. Da, da, da. If you're living your life based purely to please what other people and, you know, be high status, other people. That's fucking whack, because I will tell you something right now. That shit cuts so deep. For so many people, because they realize they have nothing else to fucking offer. It's like it's like all these chicks that show up to the date and talk about how they're a PhD. Like any man on this planet gives a fuck about your PhD. It's like showing up to a guy, it's like, I want to have kids. And you're a 35-year-old woman with a PhD. Who is more he who is he more likely to get with? That man is going to pick a homeless 20-year-old girl, 20-year-old woman over you every single time. It's like if you try to go out and make friends, the guy who, you know, buys buys a guy around or asks him about his life is going to make friends 10 times faster. It doesn't matter if that guy is a juggling homeless man. He's going to make 10 times more friends and more genuine friends than the college professor who just cries into his drink. Doesn't say shit. It's like I'm sick of seeing people who genuinely want to make America as classist as the UK. Who want to sit on their throne of, oh, I'm, I'm a fucking, I'm, I'm a white collar broker, this and that. I'm like, you can get a taste of that. It can become addictive. You can try to flex on people, but it's like, if you're the boss of your own business, to me, like, doesn't matter how blue collar it is. If you're like a fucking contractor for septic tanks and shit, and you own that shit, it's like, if you're, if you're the boss of your own plumbing company, I'm like, you know, to me and to most people, they understand like, well, if you're balling, you're balling, you know, it's like, I'm not marrying a job, you know, I'm marrying a guy. So like most women don't actually give a shit. That's the funniest part too. You'll be so obsessed about what people think and what people like, you know, assume is the right thing. And at the end of the day, they won't actually give a shit when pavement hits the road. Cause it's all about what, what gets your foot in the door. You can be as blue collar as they come and make a bunch of white collar friends by just putting your foot in the door. Like I met guy, I meet people uh, in at parties, on vacation, things like that. Come from completely different well, Sometimes that shit won't even come up. You'll spend your entire life chasing clout, and some of your best connections, the best people you meet, have nothing to do with your work, have nothing to do with your interests or hobbies. They don't have everything to do with like random shit, like random chance, you know, who you meet, who you slide a business card to or something. But at the end of the day, it's like, oh, randomly meeting a guy at a bar or playing him at a game of pool or, you know, pick up fucking basketball or going to the gym, meeting people from completely like meeting an optometrist at the gym, making friends. You know, it's like you can have friends in high places, low places. It's America. But it's like it's something everyone's equally capable of. But there is this really fucking interesting dichotomy. Yeah, we, we have to be the best version of ourselves. And like, I don't know. So that, that's like with my whole job switch and all the controversy happening in my old job, which I told you about, like the multiple company violations, the fact that I had all female leadership, didn't know what the fuck they were doing, still don't know what the fuck they're doing, lying to customers, lying to me when I was a customer too. And like all the shit that's gone on. And then realizing like, you know, you can't do shit about what other people do. You can't do shit about how they live their lives, but you cannot live your life thinking that like, oh, I didn't give 110%. And he's like, you know what? I know for a fucking fact. I know for a fucking fact. I could have crossed my knees and dotted my eyes every single day. I could have given absolutely all the effort ever at every at this job, at any job. And I know some people, they really advertise for that, like the Kevin Samuels work 60 days or 60 hour, 80 hour weeks, you know, like work three fucking full-time jobs and shit, like get your money stacked before you even, I'm like, you know what? Life is too fucking short to sell your soul to money and fame and success and status. You don't need to be a high value male in the eyes of society to achieve the things you want. I don't care. You can go to the fucking, 
You can go to the Philippines. You can go to like rural Latin America. You can go to Eastern Europe right now, no matter what race, no matter what, whatever you can think of and get yourself a fucking wife. I'm so sick of listening to incel fucking make tau bitching about how hard it is to get a woman when you can take a fucking plane flight with a passport and like, you know, 300 bucks in your fucking wallet and walk up to a random dude or girl and have immense success. It just pisses me off how much people let themselves get in the way of being their best selves. It's like, you know, Christ said, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find. And people don't want to fucking put in the effort. They don't want to put in the effort to fucking seek. They want to ask, 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 beg, 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 think life's going to fall into place. And dude, it's like some of us are lucky. Some of us are lucky and shit does fall into place. But most of us, we have to work and we have to fucking fight for everything we get in life. And sometimes life will fucking throw you a curveball. Sometimes life wants to punch you in the fucking dick. And you got to make shit work. So it's like, yeah, you can, you, can be, you can be one of these people that lets you know life just take them by the balls. And just do whatever and just go with the flow, bro. I'm like, there's a time to go. I, I love going with the flow. I, I love riding the wave. But don't let life just carry you on. People walk around aimlessly. Like, what's my purpose? I'm like, purpose? Really? You're going to sit here and wonder what your fucking purpose is? You know what your fucking purpose is. You know what your fucking purpose is. You just want to live your life like there isn't an obvious solution to most of the problems that you face. You, you don't want to sit down and actually look at your problems realistically. They're so eager to put the blame on other people. It's like your purpose in life, it could be a million different things. You can find purpose in so much, but that is on you. You got to find your purpose. You got to work towards your purpose. You got to find things you're passionate about and ways to contribute. You feel fulfillment and self-actualization by being the best version of yourself that you can. You don't find self-actualization by masturbating to internet pornography and, and talking to, you know, your friends on Tumblr and, you know, marching and marching in parades. You don't get that shit being gluing yourself to fucking girls with pearl earrings and, you know, vandalizing art pieces. Isn't going to stop people from drilling oil, you know, going out and stripping butt ass naked in traffic. Isn't going to stop police brutality. You know, these people live their lives thinking like, Oh, I have a purpose and they don't actually fucking do shit with anything in their lives. And that's okay behavior, maybe if you're 18 to 20, you know, maybe. But it's like, if you're a grown-ass adult, I had 18, I kind of already knew this shit at 18. Like, maybe it's just I'm an old soul. Like, my brain developed, like, 20 years before my body did. I was already an old man by 10, but I was in the body of a 5-year-old because my bones didn't want to grow. So it's we're just one of those things where it's like, you know, in a weird way, I just don't have – it's like I don't have excuses for other people because I don't have excuses for myself. I don't make excuses for myself, so I'm not going to make excuses for others. I'm not better than anybody else. Unless I unless I am, then there's no excuse. You can be the best version of you can, that you can be. Regard like you, all humans are imperfect, but it's like you have to be you have to be the motherfucker. You have to be the motherfucker that gets shit done. There's no excuses. There's no like but this and oh, but this and that, and oh, my, you know, this and that did this and that to me, or I was doing this and that from this age, and it's really fucked me up, and my this and that, none of that shit. I don't give a fuck. Every day is a new day. Every tomorrow is a new tomorrow. You're living in the future. The fucking present is nothing but a millisecond at a time. Your every moment you live is the future, and you can change the future if you feel like it. You can strive for greatness. And do things that put you on the right path. Moving in a positive direction. You won't ever ask what your purpose is again. If you make peace with yourself. And understand that nothing in life is guaranteed. That you have to make the most of your dreams. If you let your dreams die, that's on you. It's on you. Yeah. Example of, uh, I want to help Weiss get a hentai addiction. Legit as fuck. I, I don't, so here's, here's what I've discovered. And this is going to be a slight aside, probably what I'm going to wrap up with, but a slight aside, hentai addiction, porn addiction, all that shit that's popped up in the pandemic. What the fuck is that? All the shit that's popped up in the pandemic, well, it was there before, but 
people who are addicted to to hentai, people who are addicted to pornography, the trend that I see, because we all have to find outlets for our sexuality, but the reason I don't think hentai is as healthy, even is like I don't think I think the most unhealthy type of porn is um is heterosexual like heterosexual or gay uh insertion of a, of a of a male from like a distant angle it's like it's like programming yourself to be a fucking cuck watching other people have sex and then the actual act of like programming yourself to be aroused by that primarily by that it's like you're mentally conditioning yourself to only get off when you're watching people fuck. And it's just, again, I've used, I think I've dropped the word cucked 12 times in this stream in total, but this is literally like cucked in the, in the truest, most original sense of the word. Like you're not going to be able to get over, you know, if you, if your entire sexuality is, is tied to fucking Japanese cartoon girls screaming and, you know, pixelating everywhere, you're not going to have normal fucking relations with a woman. I don't care how much of a fucking Chad you think you are. If your if your main sexual outlet is is cartoons made by Asian people halfway across the planet, you're not gonna view women in a normal way. And what I mean by that is like, are you gonna get aroused by a real 3D girl if you have crippling hentai addiction? If the main can if you, the main outlet of your sexuality is 2D drawings, are you actually going to be able to get aroused with with a with a girl? Because what I think is, it's like people talk all about, you know, porn addiction. I think one of the most crippling aspects of it is chronic masturbation. I think the chron- I think the jacking off and orgasming three times a day, it's fucking coomer brain, bro. Like you literally are fucking, uh, you're addicted to the dopamine rush that you get from, it's like, it's a dopamine addiction. It's a dopamine addiction, just like, you know, taking heroin. It's like you're addicted to the dopamine that your brain releases from orgasm. It's not just satisfying an urge. Like, why are you doing it three times a fucking day at half chub? It's like, you know, your shit's dribbling out. You know, it's like fucking pathetic. And then these guys get in front of a girl and they have premature ejaculation or they can't get hard. And it's like, I know guys who have crippling fucking porn addiction. That is, it's, it's like the, the addiction, it's not a physical addiction. You can get over it. What they, what they're doing though, is they're conditioning themselves. It's like porn conditioning is a better term than porn addiction. It's like watching porn all the time and watching porn once a day. It's like it's like it's not like drinking. You can't consume so much porn that you fucking overdose and die. It's not in a physical addiction where your body has to watch porn. You've just tied up your sexuality to it. You've conditioned your sexuality to porn to where you can't fucking have it be anything else. Like I've talked with women. It's like you know this one girl. She was fucking in the Coast Guard and she was dating a Navy SEAL, like really hot blonde girl, but fucking tatted up, total fucking post wall roasty already. And like she, even though like she was pretty cute, especially like, you know, probably like five years ago, it was probably a bombshell. Like dude would rather jack off in the bathroom to internet pornography rather than smash her. And then like, I never understood that shit. But then I realized like these dudes have conditioned themselves so fucking much to women that, you know, don't exist. Or it's like they just condition themselves like I can only get hard and ejaculate when I stimulate myself. Like some guys are like that. And it's like it's fucking bizarre. It's like, dude, these are the type of guys that's like you're basically the, the the sexual version of like morbidly obese people who chronically eat all the fucking time. It's like, of course, your fucking sexuality is utterly warped and unhealthy if you're constantly absorbing this shit. And it's like you're tying your actual sexuality to this shit. It's not good. So it's like how to quit porn. You don't have to quit porn. You just have to stop fucking orgasming to this shit. It's like you can watch as many fucking hentai videos a day as you want. As long as it doesn't get in the way of anything. But as long as you're not tying your actual fucking sexual function to it, you'll be fine. It it might sound bizarre as shit, but I can watch fucking aquarium videos all day and not fucking have to, you know, watch an aquarium video. I don't have to watch a fish to get hard. It's the actual act of tying this behavior. It's like Pavlov's dong. You're tying your fucking actual sexual release to a piece of media. I guarantee if I kept jacking off to aquarium videos 
day, day in and day out. And I was like, oh man, let me pull up the aquarium. I need to bust a nut. That shit's going to fucking manifest. I'm like, I'm eventually going to see a great white shark and get a little bit of half chub. I'm going to go to the fucking beach and immediately start getting, you know, a little bit of tingle just because my body and my sexuality is so physiologically adapted to that shit. I don't even think, and then it's like, you know, you can watch fucking all the hentai you want. I genuinely don't think porn addiction is even a real thing. I think that porn overconsumption is a real thing, but the, what people really mean by addiction is a conditioning because that's where all the negative side effects come from. So it's like the idealistic woman or oversized hips that, or that will never be in real life. The, the hentai thing, too, involves weird, unrealistic expectations of female behavior. Because most hentai is written by men for men. Like, they can't write female characters worth a damn. They don't realize that, like, I don't know. Because women need, women need an emotional connection for arousal. It's why women can't sleep around the same way men can and walk away unscathed. It's like, because men have a purely physical raw component to their arousal and to their libido. It's like a man can fuck a woman and feel absolutely nothing for her emotionally. Like they can fuck a woman that is ostensibly much less attractive, feel nothing for them emotionally beyond. I want to smash women. Don't have that. It's just not in the female physiology unless they're just a rare specimen. There's, there is that necessary emotional component that has to be there. And I've asked women this and they've told me like, that's not true. Like I can, fuck them out without any it's like okay pr prove it prove it tell me how you're not salty off every single one of your one night stands tell me how you feel so unfulfilled like you tell me all the time how unfulfilled you are with the one night stand why because you try to get an emotional connection with the guy and he fucking breaks it off you need it. it it's something that's critical and something that is constantly lacking but it's like for men it also is is a is a fundamental part of pair bonding there's a lot of guys who will nut inside of a girl who they previously, even during the act of sex, did not give a shit about, but the actual oxytocin, whatever released during orgasm makes them bond with a woman. That's why sex is used in pair bonding. That's why sex is used in pair bonding. If you fuck a woman and don't orgasm when you fuck her, you're not going to have pair bonding as a man. As a woman, that shit is like from the get. Like you need the emotion, like the, even fucking arousal re requires that emotional connection with a man because it isn't just a pure raw testosterone filled physical urge like it is in men like it i don't know like to me because i'm not a woman and i can't fully explain it but i've had women explain it to me but the thing that what was happening to men the reason why women don't fall to porn addiction like men do is that conditioning angle it is that because women uh, like of course like a guy wanting the 10 out of 10 fucking anime anime titties with the anime booty and the anime hip ratio honestly probably more realistic than a lot of the standards some of these women have and it's like oh yeah i want my my 10 out of 10 fucking six foot tall prince charming who makes six like they literally want the top zero five percent of men and then look like they haven't skipped a fucking meal ever in their lives probably like you know women who are clearly overweight wanting men who are in the top fucking one percent as a long-term option because it because the thing is like and this is what i've noticed women will use me as like a glorified sex toy like what women actually want to attach to and actually commit to very very fucking different than what they would smash as well like it does cut both ways a lot of these MGTOW and manosphere guys miss this they miss that men and women are more equal than they are different but there's basic differences to our sexualities that have to be addressed. Men are much more susceptible to hentai addiction, for example, because the actual expectation of sex isn't just, ah, sorry. It isn't just, okay, am I getting aroused to a 2D image? No, it's the way that these hentai girls act. When you pair bond, when you orgasm to this media, you bond to it. It sounds bizarre. It's like if you, if you edge to anime or you edge to hentai, it's not the same as like orgasming. It's like when you actually orgasm and you flood your body with these endorphins, with these chemicals, it's like these are pair bonding chemicals. And the normal act of sex, this is the kind of shit you use to kind of like pair bond to a girl or pair bond into somebody. But it's not that strong. It takes some time. It's like the typical fuck boy who can like smash a girl and leave. Again, for men, it could be a purely physical reaction in a way that just isn't for women. 
In most men, yeah, that's the pair bonding chemical, but it requires some sort of emotional kindling beforehand. With with hentai, with anime, they feel these connections to these characters. They feel these connections to these anime girls. They're like, oh, well, she's so nice in the mirror. She has all these typical feminine traits, all this shit. And they get emotionally attached to the idea of this waifu or this anime girl because they display so many positive personality traits. That's what makes it so dangerous. Nobody watches fucking Riley Reed and things like, oh, man, she's the perfect girl for me, the way she acts. And it's like, no, but in hentai, they fucking do. In hentai, it's like they will deliberately make almost the ideal perfect woman. And the next thing you know, it's like not even physically, just the way she acts. And next thing you know, it's like you're fucking, you know, watching everything from this. Yeah. And it's like, and nobody's, it's like, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with a good old fashioned, you know, you know, Nakadashi here, here and then. Not, a little bukkake to, to wrap up the night. I don't agree with these guys that think that porn is the devil, that it, that it really is. What I see is that guys... And this is something I only realized by, you know, being more intelligent and like ja actively like using your hand to jack off. Like I think the first, like when I first appeared at Drexel's stream, it was all talking about sex toys. I'm like, Tantal has this, for example, it's called the Tan uh, Tantal Aurora. I'm going to like, uh, or I'm going to, I'm going to type this in the, in the comments. Uh, I, I think it's there. But like, this is an example of like, I, I feel like I totally butchered it. Cause I, I don't, it's, it's called the Aurora, but I don't know what the fuck it like the, the company itself. I kind of fucked up, but anyway, it's like, you can get one of these dolls this is like, you know, one of the best is like basically like a fully except like, you'll see like from that, like you'll, when you use a doll, and this is something I think is going to be proved in studies and shit. When you use a doll versus using your hand, completely different, completely different reaction. Like when you, when you act, your body knows the difference, the movement of your hips, the coordination of your body. Like this is why sex and masturbation are not the same thing. Like guys like, oh, you can just masturbate. Like masturbation, like physical manipulated masturbation is, is not satisfying to men. It's not like men don't know how to have a satisfying orgasm using their hand. So it's like your sexual frustration will make you pursue this more and more. And that's where I think most porn addiction really comes from. It's it's porn is not an adequate outlet for sexual frustration, but also has negative conditioning elements to it that make it hard for men to stop that. You know, you get into a perpetual cycle of jacking off to this image or jacking off to this media. And it just continues and continues. But what we gotta realize is that there are alternatives. Like you don't have to be beholden to this. You you can actually break out of the cycle very easy ways. Best things I do to list it. And you're hearing me. So it's like you need to break the initiative. The only way you can is by getting involved with people in other communities. I think, bro, the best way to break this conditioning. The best way to break this conditioning, I don't think you need anybody else. What you do is you get a doll or a flashlight or a sex toy of some kind and use that without any visual media. I Use auditory media. Use Because some people are like, I can't just use imagination. Just use that. Just use that. Like Try to achieve some sort of result without any visual media. Like you can even listen to this shit in the background. Get rid of the visual media. Use a doll instead of jacking off and I guarantee your porn addiction will go away like that. You will be able to escape porn addiction. Look at it. It's like you can literally put that shit on in the fucking background. As long as you're not looking at it or you're looking at something else, it's like you can solve it, but you need help. It's like the whole thing to me is you actually need an adequate device or an adequate method of actually relieving sexual frustration, simulating the act of sex rather than just using your hand to induce orgasm. 
Like that to me is what would cure porn addiction for, I think, a lot of men who genuinely struggle because it's breaking the cycle, breaking that cycle of look something up, get aroused, jack off, repeat. That's what needs to be broken. It's a conditioned cyclical behavior that you've made ingrained into your psychology. You no longer get the urge to have sex. You only get the urge to jack off. That's the that's what needs to change. When your brain goes from wanting to fu- to wanting to jack off to wanting to fuck, that is a paradigm shift in your, not only like your, it'll be a paradigm shift in your libido, paradigm shift even in like your testosterone levels. It's like it'll completely change the way you think about sex. It'll change the way you think about women. It'll change the way you think about life in general. When you go from wanting to wanting to jack off to wanting to have sex, it's a completely different world. And you don't even ha- you you don't even have to be like you know someone who's had sex before. You just need to be able to like simulate sex rather than just jacking off to porn. Like that's that's really the delineation. You can be a Chad type dude, have sex every single night. You don't need it's all this semen retention, no fap shit is bullet bullshit, bull fucking shit. There are some advantages to keeping yourself like tense and fresher, but it's like purely just to harness that energy. All you want, all you're trying to do is harness that energy. The more frustrated you are, the more gas you're willing to give. It's good for like combat sports, like Mike Tyson not jacking up before a match or like football. Don't jack off before the football game. You know, you want to go there with a loaded gun. Cheerleaders distracting you and shit, but it's like, you know, but you also don't want to be hyper aware because that's another thing. It's like the longer you go without jacking off, it'll affect your mood, make you pissy. Because sexual frustration will make you pissy, and then it'll also make you view women like me, and it's just going to be really distracting. So it's like, yeah, fucking day twenty eight of no fap of my fucking college lecture, and I can't focus on shit. It's like, yeah, so how how zen am I right now? But yeah, dude, it's pretty it's pretty incredible. But yeah, the the mindset. Yeah, it's hard changing the mindset, but the mindset will change. If you actually give yourself a reasonable outlet for your sexual frustration, if you go, if you, if you change your mindset, you can change your mindset very easily by using something else besides your hand to, to get yourself off. Cause that, that auto gratification is not good. And whether you are the type of guy that can just do no fab, whether you are the kind of guy that can find an outlet another way, that's ideal, but it's just not realistic for most men. Yeah. Yeah, the dating market. So I'm I'm gonna put it to you like this. I'm gonna try to explain this the best I can. I think I'm gonna probably wrap up the stream like this. I don't know. I hope I'm not getting a nosebleed. But there's so the dating market is not a good place to learn how to have sex. the The thing about dating. I honestly recommend just getting a getting a doll first because dating is the sort of thing women are like really unforgivable. Like they really are not going to give you any slack. Women will lay there like a tranquilized fucking starfish. They will lay there like roadkill and let you do your thing. And it is it's like I've only legitimately. I mean, I've, I've been with women who tried their best, especially like longer term relationship stuff. I've only really met one woman who genuinely blew my mind in the bedroom. But it's like when you, what you realize in the dating market, bro, it's like, it's all you. It's like, it's all, it's all you. It's like, you gotta be the one who busts out all the stops. Like you gotta dick this girl down, bro. You gotta, you gotta be the man. And it's like, that shit is too, it's too fucking annoying. Like you go through all of this bullshit in the dating process. If your goal is to have sex, like this is why I don't, like even this is why I just really don't, do the fuck boy thing as much as people think I do. Cause I'm like, you know what, man, if I'm going to go through all the effort to attract this girl and get with this girl, oftentimes I only pull the, pull the smash and pass thing, the, the pump and dump only when I'm like, I've gone through so much effort. I need to get something out of this, but it's like dating. You're hopefully doing it purely as a way to get a girlfriend. If you're trying to do it to have sex, I'm sorry to tell you, man, like, you know, the sex comes second. Like you got to know who you are. You, the, the dating advice I give people is like, know who you want to attract, know who your crowd is and pay attention to signals. Like, you know, you're not going to get laid trying to go after women who aren't attracted to you. you got to catch signals from women. You kind of feel like already sort of are into you. 
Like talk to is like this is why just talking to women in general is like the first step. Just it's like that's half of the success. It's like talking to women so you can catch those signals. Because sometimes women will give you signals that'll bullshit you. That's part of the game. It's like that's why it's like never a perfect game. But it's like I just chose to stop engaging with women who I knew weren't attracted to me. I'm not, I'm not going to wait for this girl to suddenly like you know come around. I'm not going to ask her out multiple times. There's a there's a time to be persistent, but you know you gotta you gotta be smart about you know how you do dating but honestly you curing your addiction first like getting out of that like porn addiction first like the dating market is so unforgivable that i mean shit bro i i honestly think that putting too much effort into it in the first place will kill your sanity but i'd, I'd recommend getting your your sexual like your sexual outlet sorted beforehand wait i already read that Yeah, it's so, so like, yeah, so I mean, change, the change isn't, I feel like, you know, the change in the improvement doesn't have to be that drastic, bro. Like, you don't, uh, there's, there's methods and technique, because I, I, when I was a kid, you know, very goody two shoes, everything, I went through a phase where I personally experienced, like, it was, it was because I had a TV in my room, and I had the PlayStation, I could always go on the browser, and bro, like fucking full screen porn, like when you're like this sheltered ass kid and you finally have access to that, like, bro, I was like the fucking Coomer meme. Like over summer, I was the Coomer meme. Like I'd spend all my time outside and whenever I had any time alone. I was at a family of like a, a family of five. When I ever had any time alone to myself, it was straight Coomerism. And I like conditioned myself. It was like the moment I'm home alone, I'd, I'd get aroused. And it's like my mind was so conditioned the moment I had any amount of alone time, it was the first thing I did. And I noticed it and I noticed it's like how conditioned I was towards it. And I'm like, dude, this has to change because it's just like it was affecting the way I was like, you know, it was affecting like just who I was. Like I couldn't even see girls my age as attractive because I was so fucking sh shook on that shit. And it was like I could only it was like I, I wasn't feeling really and it was good because I fucking hated I didn't date in high school, but it, it's like, it's kind of bit me in the ass in a lot of ways. And I've noticed the long-term ramifications, like you can change your mindset and improve yourself, but you know, you're always going to be kind of imprinted by that. Like I, I blame pornography and, and anime example, for example, for influencing the type of women I prefer and approach. Like you're not going to, you know, go through, like go through a childhood or go through a formative years doing this shit, and not be affected. That's why I'm like, I'm really afraid for these like younger kids who watch much more hardcore shit than I ever watched as a kid. I'm like, these dudes are simping for girls on fucking only fans. I'm like, what's that going to do to them when they're older men? Like I never sent, I never gave women shit on the fucking internet so they can show their titties. Like that's crazy as fuck. But I think like there are ways, like I think again, like you don't even have to really change much. Like you don't even have to like really change what you're like putting on. It's like, if you just, remove the visual stimulus and then add a doll or a flashlight. You can buy a fucking flashlight for like 60 bucks. Like you don't even have to break the fucking bank, like roll that shit up in some blankets and go ham or, you know, get a doll that's, you know, get a own a hole or some shit. That's like fucking $25. Like you don't even have to fucking really commit. Just don't use your fucking hand. And you know, you'll have like more six. And this is for like, you know, this is general advice, but really if you're suffering and you're still trying to get out and you're like, need that final push. That's what I've seen works for the most men. Like everyone wants to like have this shame about it, but if these men are suffering from porn addiction, like that's they if anything you can do to break their conditioning. That's the best way I found. It's like, it's like if you don't give them anything else, it's like they're not gonna fucking you know use their fucking mind powers to somehow find a sexual outlet. It's like these guys who want you to quit porn want you to fucking no fat for thirty days straight and only orgasm in your sleep from wet dreams. It's just so unrealistic. I fucking hate those guys because they're not realistic about male sexuality. They want to act like every male can be a monk or turn their libido off just by thinking hard enough and stupid. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the main thing about, you know, and, and you mentioned the ATM angle. The main thing I, I think, and I'm going to probably like leave it with this. I'm going to just get in like full, full dude mode. The main thing I've noticed about transactional dating 
or dating in general, like what the deal is. There's nothing wrong with the transactional relationship as long as there's actually a transaction. It's like women will act like, oh, I'm not entitled to a romantic relationship with you, but you need to still give me attention and resources. I'm not, you know, I'm not entitled to sleep with you. I'm not entitled to be your girlfriend, but I still want you to, you know, go out for free drinks and provide me shit. It's, it's why like, you know, any money I spend on a woman, I'm not going to cry about, you know, this is, this is money. It's like giving money away from a friend. You're probably not going to get that money back. But dating, I just think it's one of those things where, you know, you just, you got to see that shit as a video game, man. You got to, you got to have fun doing that shit. You got to see it as a hobby. Because if you take it too seriously, you're going to fucking hate your life. So many dudes, that's exactly what they take it seriously. It's like, this shit's a game. That's why so many women complain about fuckboys. It's a game, dude. Anybody who actually succeeds in dating sees this shit as a game. Because it's the only way you're going to stay in. It's like, just showing up is the name of the game. So many guys, they get disappointed. It's like, oh, I'm just going to quit dating. I'm like, dude, why? It's like, I know you hate it, but it's like, you don't have to date the same way. You could literally just ask women. You can match women on fucking dating apps. Just ask them to straight to your place. I, I was like, my main thing, the only gas, the money I spend is mostly on gas. I'm like, I'm picking up the girl. I'm going for fucking ice cream. You know, spend some money on some ice cream, maybe. Like, go for a couple drinks. Like, not a lot of drinks. But that's the most money I'll ever spend. Like, I'm not taking you to a fucking fancy dinner. I'm, we're going to cook at my house. I'm going to buy some fucking cheap $5 wine. We're going to get, like, you know, fucking sloshed. You're going to smash. It's like, you just realize what they want. Like, what do you want out of the dating market? But, like, that's that's what it is. Like, what you want out of the dating market is what matters. Like, what you want out of dating should be the first thing you think about before you try dating. It's like, if you want to do the whole sit down and pull the chair out, chivalry shit, if you're looking for that, it's like, you don't need, it's like the craziest part, you'll find totally girlfriend material type chicks and it'll just flow. Like it, you won't even have to think about that shit. Everything will fall into line. It's like, there's so many strategies they give you for dating. When shit works out, it just fucking works out. And you don't really have to think about it. Like that's the thing people never tell you. Like when the shit works when the shit, when the shit is right, when the new actually are compatible, chemistry alone is good enough. Like no amount of dating coaches, no amount of dating advice is going to change that shit. I just think guys need to improve themselves first before like putting themselves under the scrutiny of women. Because that's what's going to happen. You're going to be under a magnifying glass of this girl. She's going to look for all kinds of weird behaviors because of course she's the catch. And it's like, that's, but that's realistic. It's like, that's realistically what you got to do. You got to improve yourself. And make sure that you're not like, you know, you know, make sure you're not going to get your feelings hurt. Biggest thing I tell guys, I'm like, you know, don't enter the dating game before you're actually ready. Like I didn't enter the dating game in high school. And when I tried to date again, my ass wasn't ready. Like I spent a lot of my late teens and early twenties suffering in the dating market because I, I didn't realize, I didn't realize what it meant. It only took, cause I've been with. eight women only eight and so it's like you know oh there's guys with much higher body counts like edwin has a much higher body count than me like he's been with more women but that's just because i'm kind of picky and i and i really kind of pick and choose uh who who i who i kind of like but it's like you know man it's it's never easy like you can be as attractive as you want to say but even the most attractive dudes i know it's like you get used and abused and tossed away in the dating market it's like, if you're trying to find a girlfriend, good luck. If you're trying to find, you know, temporary sex, like whatever. But the dating market is is nothing to really walk into and be in. It's like, you can't envy other guys for their success. You can't like compare yourself to other people. And you can't act like, you know, anybody's advice is going to help you seal the deal at the end. At the end of the day, it's you, bro. It's like, that's what the girl's going to like. That's who she's going to be into. It's you. I can give you as many tips. Like, oh, you say this and do that and act smooth. Like oftentimes just, you know, people, it's like, well, it's cliche to just say, be yourself. I'm like, as long as you're not a fucking spaz, just be chill. It's like, don't be yourself. Just be chill. Be chill. Then, you know, just, you know, yeah, be yourself, but don't try. It's like the more you try, the more obvious it is that you're trying. And honestly, I go on dates and every time, like, even at this point in my life, I'm still like, what the fuck am I even doing? Like, I'll think to myself, like, what am I saying? What am I doing? 
you just got to roll with the punches whenever, however they come, whenever they come, because dating, it's like, I think find like solving the problems you have with yourself first, start getting over, you know, bad habits and addictions and getting your money right and all this stuff. It's like, if you're going to invite this girl into your personal life, because this is what you're doing when you date. Like if this girl becomes your girlfriend, fuck buddy, whatever the fuck you make of it, you're inviting her into your personal life, your personal space. And you really need to get your shit together first before you can expect someone else to be, you know, enamored and attracted to that. So. Yeah. But. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think it's rocket science. I don't think it takes hours of discussion. I don't think it takes lectures and TED Talks to tell guys it's like, you know, you know, women like a diverse amount of stuff. It's like, you know, you you just have to, again, if you just put yourself out there and play the fucking game, you are going to get lucky eventually. Statistically speaking, it's going to happen. Like you approach enough women, you talk to enough of them, you swipe enough times and long enough. Like, bro, my, my shit on Tinder, Tinder will, for a month fucking straight. I'll swipe on every girl in my area. No more no more people. No, sh no nothing. And then just randomly out of the blue, I'll just get like a random fucking cute ass girl. Like I'll get a bunch of fucking ogres. I'll like kind of entertain it. I won't get shit. Won't get shit. Won't even use the app. Won't even swipe on motherfuckers. Open the app again. Turns out I match with the cutie. It's like that just sh sometimes fucking happens. And I have way more luck on, t I, like, I literally think I'm like 85th percentile, like short of the 90th percentile, I'm not like the high value male, but definitely striking enough to be above, you know, to be in the 80%, maybe I'm like 82nd percentile or something like, you know, I'm just good enough to have some decent success, kind of. And like, that is, is, is so much better than other guys who like really spend like most of their time just trying to even just be visible to women. And that's what I fucking, that's why I'm like, get a passport, man. Get a, get a fucking passport. Like I'm like, even, even for me, it's like even doing well in the West, it's like, dude, if you're invisible to women in the Western countries, why are you even trying to date here? Like my main thing is like, no, know your audience, like going and dating in Hungary or dating in, you know, Ecuador or dating in Kenya or dating in, in Vietnam is going to, even with the language barrier, even with, you know, massive culture shock, you're going to have a 10 times better time, easier time. Even if these women are just there to, you know, target the foreign dude who will spend money on them. Even if it is purely transaction, better deal than anything you get in the West. That woman will totally put out for you. She just wants a good time. She just wants money to spend on them. And you'll be shocked. You'll, you'll be shocked how quick they are to like, you know, throw themselves at girls. Like I've been with, like I've been with women who honest to fucking God, like just blow certain girls. I've approached them. I've been swerved by women. Like just to put this in perspective that it's like really just on you at the end. I've been swerved by women who honest to fucking God, if they knew the type of girls I've been with before, it's like, they, it's like it, it, they would probably just like, they would probably have changed their mind. It's, it's so funny. Like getting the mind of these people that are like, Oh, who the fuck is this guy? Would you be like, all these girls are like, Oh, whatever. I'm like, bro, like you're not even as cute as like half of my exes. It's so funny getting like seeing women swerve me that it's honestly like, I wouldn't even take a second look at. And then women who I fully expected to swerve me or not like me, then totally like commit. It's like, it's mind blowing. And so it's, even though I'm, I purely just go out there kind of play the numbers game. Most of the time, my girlfriends are pretty fucking cute. And even these, the girls I randomly smash are pretty fucking cute. I think there's only like one girl that I can think of that I don't think was like especially cute. I guess two that weren't that cute, but the rest were definitely pretty hot. And it's just kind of funny. It's just, it's a weird thing about life. It's like you set out to do one thing and you get another thing happening to you. But again, dating is the kind of thing where it's like, dude, I've been in the dating game now for nine years officially. I didn't really, I wasn't really in it in high school. I wasn't taking it that seriously in college, but still I'll say, I'll say a solid nine years in the dating game. Definitely picked up in Germany, but, oh God. But yeah, it's again, the passport thing. What I, what I see with the passport thing, and I'm probably, we're going to hit the 30, the, the 345 mark.
So it's about a minute. So with this last minute, yeah, dude. I mean, I honestly advise Emmanuel just start trying to get into the dating game uh, in the foreign countries. Like, yeah, you can work on yourself here in America, stack your chips in America. But that's always what I advise. Like, dude, if you're going for wife hunting, if you're trying to get that trad wife and people are like, oh, don't bring her back to the U.S. I'm like, depends. They're like, bring her back to an actual community with actual values. Like, don't like live in fucking San Francisco and bring your wife back to fucking San Francisco. Like, don't be a fucking idiot. Don't bring her back to some lib shit, like dumbass hole that you, you think like, oh yeah, it's okay if I bring my wife back to Berkeley and help her through school. Like, don't be a cuck. Like, don't be a fucking idiot. Don't, don't let your trad wife get involved with groups and want her to like divorce her husband and fucking, you know, become a lesbian and shit. Like, just, just be smart. But yeah, dude, it, honestly, that's my, that's the advice. Like, don't even try dating in the West. D dating in the West, unless you just enjoy it, unless you just have a thing for these girls. Like, I hate American women. I fucking hate dating in America. That shit is just fucking annoying. Like, I fucking hate, like, American women are unhealthy or mentally ill and just not taking care of themselves still think they're catches. It's the most mind blowing shit I've ever seen. Women who have this, like self diagnosed depression, anxiety, like a thousand, like bi bipolar disorder, like can't fucking maintain healthy weight, like fucking shit, everything shit skin from wearing like too much makeup and messed up teeth still think they're bad. And you still think that you're like a fucking troglodyte, but it just makes me laugh. I'm like that shit blows me away like german women are cuter just it's like german women are seen as like some of the least attractive women in europe and they're more attractive just by default don't wear hardly as many as much makeup way better skin way better hair and just like typically pretty thin and active and it's just even if they look like complete five out of tens a five out of ten in germany is like a seven out of ten in america and yet these girls who are fucking fat and they think they're thick and then still swerve you still think they're bad i'm like bro you've like i can get a, a an eight out of ten in mexico city in like five minutes and i'm over here like scrounging for fours in humboldt county it's like that shit's retarded yeah and you and you don't have to do it for us you know like for ourselves and the community we make yeah it's like we we it's like we can like being our best it's like you know why be anything else it's like we don't have to like live up to some massive example we make for ourselves like we don't have to live up to expectations we don't have to do things for other people it's just like why not be the best like what am i getting out of life if i'm not giving it you know 110 percent? but you know for me it's like i'm my best self because i just realized if i'm not my best self i'm like i'm miserable like i don't want to be i don't want to be that guy who knows that i squandered opportunities that i could have taken yeah fucking land wheels bro I, I think that America, America's only going to change. Again, is this a, oh, I might, I might be getting, hopefully not a nosebleed. But it's like, I, I know America and Americans can change, but American women, oh, it's, it's just like all the pain to deal with these fucking, to deal with these fucking idiots who just walk around every fucking, and they just don't understand. They don't even understand how low value they are. It's like they don't understand how low fucking valued bottom of the barrel dregs that they are. It's like I don't care how hot you are. If your mind's blasted off Molly and you fuck 25 guys, I'll take I'll take a 5 out of 10 virgin from Bulgaria over you every fucking single day. If you're a 35-year-old single mother with a PhD, I'm taking the fucking 19-year-old Slovenian peasant every fucking time. I don't care if this bitch has mismatched shoes and crooked ass teeth. I'm taking her over you and your manicured fucking nails and your perfect fucking boob job every single day. I do not give a fuck because you're so vapid and you're so vain and you still don't even have a modicum of the attractive traits that I'd want to see in a partner. Yeah. And it, and it is like Rome. It is full blown fucking degeneracy, but it's like, we see this shit and they don't want to acknowledge it as degeneracy but it's like, you know, what's more degenerate than a negative birth rate? You know, what's more degenerate than fucking killing children in the name of eugenics? What's more degenerate than funding foreign wars that do nothing but make, you know, weapons dealers rich? Like, what's what's more degenerate than encouraging our kids, you know, to, to embrace homosexuality or by rejecting religion? It's like things that people point to as like, oh, this is conservative Bible thumping horse shit. 
But I'm like, you know, traditional values are what built America and what built all of the Western society. And people acting like people acting like colonialism's the devil. People acting like, you know, modern civilization could have come about when people with, with people who had better moral fabric. And by better moral fabric, it just means that they're more tolerant, whatever, like they're accepting. And it's like, no, no, that's that's not what happens. It's like, and people think that this shit is just like a natural progression. And I'm like, look at Iran and North Korea. It's like we we clearly see what happens when people get their shit together and logical things fall into place. But people want to live in denial of reality. They want to think that their version of reality and their ideal version of reality, that's all kumbaya and smiles and sunshine is how shit gets, gets done. But it's like, you know what, man? When you're suffering the consequences of your sexual liberation, when you're suffering the consequences of your bad diet, when you when you are suffering the consequences of your skincare routine, which involves kicking yourself in makeup so you can have chronic fucking acne, it's like don't ask yourself why you're losing out to, you know, peasant girls from Yucatan and, you know, African mail order brides when you can't fucking take care of yourself. When you have shit hygiene because you vape and smoke all day, when your hair is fucked up because you put all kinds of chemicals in it, when your skin is fucked up because you cake it in, in accessories and cosmetics, when your nails are fucked up because you, you keep applying chemicals to them every single week, it's like when your body is fucked up because you can't hold in the fourth cheeseburger of the day, and when your mind is fucked up because you keep taking all kinds of different fucking mind-altering substances – and, and keep going to therapists that enable your behavior. Don't be shocked when men don't want anything to fucking do with you. I don't think men need dating advice as much as women need dating advice. That is my personal, honest to God opinion. I don't think men need to dating advice as much as women do. Women need to get their fucking shit together, bro. Because like women are the ones that take the shit the most seriously. Like men, yeah, there's the incels, there's the Elliot Rogers type dudes. But now you have women in their you know, women who are in the best years of their lives, throwing that shit away, pissing it away, you know, being bisexual or, you know, being party girls or, you know, taking all kinds of shit. And it's like, you know, that one day they're going to regret this shit. But the thing is, is that we no longer live in a society that even, even in the modern day, no matter how degenerate society gets, men will never fucking cuff that shit. And men are now driving the, the marriage rates, it's like the marriage rates through the through the floor. It's like these women, they're so convinced that at one point, like, oh, I'm going to settle down and get married. But, but, you know, men get a vote and that's, that's the thing. It's like the dating market needs to change because I, and I think multiple people have said this already. It's becoming a thing. I know that like Joker at better bachelor kind of mentioned it. It's been a thing going around, but like hookup culture hurts women more than it hurts men. Like it hurts women more than it hurts men. Sexual liberation has, has been a major detriment to women because it just makes them feel used and objectified. It, may, it makes them realize that, look, like, you know, it isn't about me. Like, I am not special. Like, these guys, you know, they use me uh, to, to orgasm and they throw me away like trash because I go for the top 10% attractive dudes and those guys are so spoiled for options. They don't give a fuck about committing to me. I'm not good enough. And they know they're not good enough. They're so fucked up and degenerate that they know they're not good enough. That's what this is doing. It's like you're taking women who otherwise could easily have caught that 90% dude because you have tattoos and piercings and you're a feminist and you have all these other fucking, you know, traits, qualities, disorders, you know, you can't fucking actually secure the guy that you want. And that's what's most tragic. It's like women who should have every option to be able to get the man that they want and desire, but are unable to because of various reasons that oftentimes are within their control. But I don't think guys need that much advice. I'm like, you know, guys, it's just numbers. Just show up. There's going to be a type of girl that's attracted to you. But women will take a guy. And this happens to me so often because I really am the monogamous type of guy. They'll take a guy who they know is a good man, who they knew was a good catch for them. And they'll throw that shit away. Like my ex-girlfriend just wants to be a free fucking spirit. It's like perfectly compatible, great couple, great energy, great chemistry all around. Throws it away because she just wants to eat, pray, love. And it's just like, okay. Okay. And it's like just every single one of them, just a long line of good men, a long line of decent dudes that they leave behind. Guys who have great – and then it's like they get to the end of the rope. They're 30, 31, 32. They look back and they're like, well, I fucked up. And this is why like dudes – you know, you this is why like I like hearing from dudes like Drex and Joker and like these older dudes in the, in the sphere because 
they know what it's like to get hit up from girls that they went to high school with in their mid thirties and in late th in their mid and late thirties. They're getting hit up by these girls like 20 years after the fact, two decades after high school. And it's like, yo, this, these were girls that didn't you know, like fucking cheerleading captains and look twice at you all this whoop de whoop. And it's like the guys have taken such good care of themselves. They look better at fucking 50 than these girls did at 30. And it's like these girls like blow themselves out. They hit the wall by 23. And it's like you, if you took care of yourself, you would hit the wall at like 35 years old. There's women who still look great in their early 30s. But most women aren't taking good enough care of themselves to look that way. I can already tell when you're frumpy and shitty looking and, you know, overweight and smoking and shit. And you're only like 20 years old. Like your 20s. It's like you know, that that shit is gone quick. So you got to be careful. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that there's no such thing as a female incel. It's like the tra the reason I think women have to improve their dating and like prove, you know, what they're doing is because they have success in dating. Women succeed in dating. No matter what kind of woman you are, no matter who you are, you can find a guy who wants to smash. Guaranteed. I don't, I don't believe for a single fucking second that, that you can't. And it's like, there's no such thing as a female incel. What is, what's wrong with these women? And I've met these type of women. They are self-destructive. Before a guy can even get his foot in the door, they shoot him down because he doesn't live up to some standard. Whatever. It's like I got into this incident with this girl. Like botany students are always fucking autistic. I'm constantly getting into shit with botany students. It was like last semester. This girl talk about her problems. Basically her fucking emotional tampon therapist, whatever. Doesn't want to do shit with me. Doesn't want to meet up for a coffee. Doesn't want to do anything. Still thinks I'm going to accept being in a friend zone. Still thinks I'm going to accept being a friend ridiculous it's like utterly fucking delusional and the reason is because they genuinely think so fucking little for men yeah and it's like i and realize i don't have a heart for them what i'm what i'm just trying to focus on is like what is best for us as a society because i don't want to you know bring kids into this country into the society and they're all there you know the parents of the daughters they'll be marrying are these women who fuck 30 fucking guys and, you know, they're single fucking parents and they have no father figure. It's like, these are the women that our kids, if we have kids, are going to have to fucking marry. It's like a perpetually self-repeating cycle of, you know, oh, sexual liberation. But are they finally going to get the message? Are we finally going to get a return to like fucking moral decent standards among women in our society? Because it really, it's like, I'm sorry, but as many, many in, in this society as exist, it's like, don't you men are not fuck boys. You know, men aren't just fucking girls and leaving. You're focusing on maybe one tenth, if that, of all men. You deliberately throw yourselves at the top 10% of males, act shocked that they pump and dump you because every other female is doing the same fucking thing, and then ignore the bottom 90% of men who have maybe had one or two sexual partners in their entire fucking lives. With the number of sexual partners I've had, I didn't even realize this. I, I compare myself to dudes who are like giga chads. Or dudes who have just fucked a lot. It's like, I fucking forget that most dudes I talk to have never had sex. And they've never been with women. And that's normal. It's legitimately normal to not have had sexual relations. Even back in history, a lot of men were virgins until they were in late, late 20s, until the military service was over. In Germanic culture, it was considered fucking uncouth for a man to have sex until his like mid to late 20s either. So it's been a thing throughout human history. It's just normal. You know, when you become reproductively fertile, you're not guaranteed to have sex. In fact, like, you know, most deer, white-tailed deer, they, they, you know, they become sexually mature two to three years old, still not going to be able to mate until between seven and 11 years old. You know, it's going to be most of their, it's basically the deer only get to mate when they're middle age and able to compete with the largest males. So it's like in human reproductive uh, ability, you know, our, our average births per age, not our fertility rate, but average births per age for men spike in our 40s remember that like this is what guys forget look at any study involving not fertility rate because fertility rate is also pretty red pilling because it shows that male fertility persists basically indefinitely it lowers but if you look at mean births per age group per age male you know male human beings men sire the most offspring in our 40s 
That's that's when you will statistically sire the most offspring. You'll have the most kids in your 40s, not in your 20s, not in your 30s, but your 40s. Their 40s is when you reproductively peak, and then you have these little. Then it drops, but it's still, you know, it's still higher than zero. You're still much more likely to have children being a 50 year old, 60 year old, 70 year old man than you are being a woman of that age. Because by 50, 51 years old. Women in going through menopause. The average American woman will go, will go through menopause at 50 years old. 51 at the latest, but they're coping and seething. Your fertility is already one-fifth of what it was at 45 than when you were 25. Geriatric pregnancy at 35. I just have a cousin who had a, had a baby, I think, at 35. or Yeah, 34, 35. It was her second kid. You know, women can still have children in their 30s and 40s. But if you're, but it's like if, but that already means you already have to be pretty fertile in your twenties. If your fertility, your fertility will drop accordingly. If you're really fertile in your twenties, you can get away with having, you know, waiting till your thirties and forties to have kids. But those eggs are going to be dry for everyone else. If you've been taking birth control for fifteen fucking years straight, if you've been taking birth control since you're fourteen years old. Get off birth control at thirty-five to have a baby. You're not. Your fucking eggs are dead. Your eggs are fried as fuck. Shit looking like a fucking dare commercial. You're, there's no eggs to be found. You shot all your eggs by decades of hormone abuse. You abuse, you, it's like fucking taking steroids. Like you abuse your fucking hormones and your sex cycle for so long because you don't want to have kids. You want to hoe out. You want to keep your cycles regular. But in reality, the birth control you're taking is fucked up your reproductive system. This is why these bitches at, at 35 are no eggs. It's like this is why, you know, they're they're trying to have their first pregnancy and all their frozen eggs don't work. It's like, dude, you can't be taking birth control and think that that's not going to fuck up your body in 10 years, 15 years time. Start taking birth control when you're a 15 year old girl, then wonder at 35 why you can't get pregnant. It's just like cope and see. It's like, this is what you did. Again, this is why I'm not apologizing for it. And it's like, you know, sexual liberation is a feminine, is a feminist movement. It's a female movement, not a male one. Men aren't trying to be sexually liberated. Like most men, they're just trying to, you know, get some sort of attention to women like women don't get it women don't understand what it's like to be men and so we now live in a society where we have the patriarchy but most half of all men are virgins but we live in a patriarchy isn't that fucking hilarious what a patriarchy we live in yeah yeah what oh yeah i missed the one yeah, and it's like, and we forget how many of these births that are actually, you know, negative birth rates, but below placement of birth, um, below replacement birth rates for everyone but like conservative fundamentalist Christians, basically. It is, it is pretty telling though, that so many urban like city births are single mothers. It's like even in the countryside, it's like single mothers. It's like if you're not Elon Musk with your little mating contracts and shit, then you're getting fucked over. You're basically like paying child support because you accidentally got somebody pregnant and that fucking blows ass. Like you don't, don't be that guy. Don't take that L. That L is not an L you want to take, but, oh, we're still at the reef, but don't take that L man. Like that's, that's just not going to work out. Yeah. It's going to basically be the Ayatollah. It's going to be Ayatollah time. Like there's going to be a limit to where, and I don't even know if it's going to be our generation, next generation. But it's it, when when men it, all of this shit and when, this is what people forget. It sounds chauvinistic. It sounds sexist. But this is only going to persist as long as men let it persist. And women know this. Like women know that if men decided to come together and say like no more Nineteenth Amendment, no more of this, they know that they would. It's like they're afraid of the patriarchy as an idealistic concept, not because the patriarchy actually exists. But because if the patriarchy did fucking exist in America, they would have not a leg to stand on. It was like, what are you going to do? If men decide to put you in your place, what are you going to do about it? What, are you going to fight? Are you going to get guns and take to the streets? I don't fucking think so. So it's like, it's men. American men are letting this persist as long as they want. But thing is, is like, I'm not going to be arbiter for change. I'm not going to sit here and be called buzzwords. Like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just fucking troll the shit out of them by going after foreign women. It's like, if this society doesn't want to fucking, you know, provide me with a decent quality woman, I'll look overseas, bro. 
Or I'll just go after younger women. Like the girl I have a date with next week is 18 years old. Like I don't give a shit. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna date someone my age if they if they fuck 25 different guys. I'm I'm not gonna you know get with somebody at 30 years who's 30 years old. Like I dated only one girl who's my age and I fucking read it. It was like probably my least favorite relationship of all of them. And it was a girl my age, just because she had so much fucking baggage and so many expectations. No, it's the thing is they don't have control. They have zero control. It's like they have the illusion of control because they they have successfully infiltrated certain institutions that make them think that they're special. Their control is an illusion. What they have is a halo. Like what they have is a remnant of traditional civility. Because once that's lost, like once it's like equal rights means equal fights time, once you have the true death of simping and chivalry, the only control they have is vaginal. Like once you – in our modern society, all of that old convention, they've purposefully eroded their own gender roles. So now you're at the point where you see guys knocking girls out on the subway. You know, women will get like robbed in broad daylight. Ain't a single dude in sight to help them. It's like guys aren't trying to catch cases. Like you, you try to sue people. You try to call guys like – rapists and perverts for interfering with shit like that one guy changing a tire that that woman accused of rape it's like now it's gotten to the point where it's cutthroat and no one actually fucking gives a shit about you that's what that's how men live their lives they don't they don't expect pastors by to jump in and help them when shit goes down they have to rely on their own like no one gives a fuck about you but women are coddled like they they genuinely think like oh it's still, it's all about us and what we want to do but it's like it's like the control is a facade like there's no control by either sex we're all beholden to different factors, but they don't control shit. Like they can try to control a narrative. They can try to control like what people, but it's like in re reality is, is reality. If they had control, they wouldn't be complaining about fuck boys. If they had control, marriage rates wouldn't be through the toilet. They'd be able to get married as soon as they could want to get married. They could have kids as soon as they want to have kids. They would get their high value male, their six pack, six foot, you know, six inch dick, you know, six figure income dude, whenever they wanted. If they had control, that's what they would be able to get just like that. But they don't have control. They don't have control because they can't get any of that. Men get a vote. Men are the ones that control the keys to long-term relationships. Women control the keys to sex 100%. If they open their legs or don't open their legs, not a thing a man can do unless he wants to catch a charge. But you're not going to see a single female on this planet convince a man to, to marry her without the man wanting to actually go through the effort. They don't even want that. They want the guy to propose. They want the guy to come up and, you know, decide to want to get married. They don't want to have a big fucking argument about getting married. But it's going to happen. It's like the guy, if he decides like, oh, you know, I want to meet new people and fucking breaks up with him because he wants to have more sex with different people because he's a Chad and he's getting like fucking 13 DMs. Tough titty. How much control you had then? Yeah. It's 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 a thing where it's you know, you got to understand your power as a man too. Cuz even though the patriarchy doesn't exist, cuz if it did exist, we would not be living in the society we did we do now. Fucking Saudi Arabia is a patriarchy, okay? Like if you can fucking drive and hold a license as a woman and you can vote, you're not living in a patriarchy. Just saying. Just saying if you have political power at all, you're you're not living in a patriarchy, sweetheart. I'm sorry. Just gonna just gonna break that shit down like a Walmart shotgun, yeah. But it, this everything is happening, man. It's just, it's not gonna last forever. Like we can tell, birth rates alone, it's like the you know, people on the left aren't having kids. When the only people having kids are gonna be like the Amish fundamentalist Christians and conservative types, it's like that's the kind of families people are gonna get raised in. And yeah, sure, you might get like you know hippie two point like conservative parents, like eat, pray, love, all that shit. But I don't think so. I, I honestly think their own policies are going to shoot them in the foot. And that future, the future Western civilization is not going to include those people. Those people are selecting themselves out of the fucking gene pool. And you're just not going to get them. Like the people who are the most susceptible to that shit are auto selecting their genes out of the population. And they're proving themselves to be an excellent example for what not to do. It's like the fucking Amish. It's like, oh, how are the Amish? They're like, I'm sure that they'll start 
you know, as, as the old owner, Amish grow, I'm sure they'll start more, hemorrhaging more and more people to broader society. Not as long as society is like it is now. Like there's no Amish looking at broader society. Like it's so much better than traditional Amish culture. It's so ignorant and back. It's like, no dude, like they're going to look at that shit and be like, the fuck is wrong with these people? There's like pride parades and like fucking drag queen, you know, story time shit. No Amish person is looking at modern America and wanting to assimilate. They have a retention rate of like 98% for their youth, like for a reason. So yeah, man, it's like you can't break down and attack the nuclear family and then think that you're going to benefit from that. Like they, if you fool yourself into thinking that, then cool, but it's not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, people don't want to take accountability. It's like if you're a man and you don't groom yourself and you don't stay in shape, you're just as much to blame as a woman who does the same thing. Again, this uh, human beings are more similar than they are different. I'm convinced of that. Like a woman and a man are going to be more similar than different. But there's key differences. There's key realities both parties have to face. And to me, there's nothing more obvious than the fact that like you got to determine, are you going to let your politics, are you going to let your feelings, and are you going to let your perception of the wor world influence your ability to actually find a good man and vice versa for guys are you going to let yourself be beholden to the will of people who hate you and think that you're a fucking idiot are you gonna are you gonna actually go for what you want or gonna go for what people expect you to want that's the question normal guys who are invisible to women get a passport and leave don't eat don't even mess with them don't give them the pleasure of rejecting you if you're really at that point, if you know who you are, like you either have to see dating and rejection as just a game that you don't take seriously or just disengage and be more serious about matchmaking because trying to participate in modern dating with the hope that you might find somebody serious or cares, it's just not going to work. So yeah, you got, you got to got to take things as they come it's it's a bleak society we live in in some respects but it's not that bad things could be worse and it probably will get worse but no nah. it's like nobody can point to the other like men can't blame women women can't blame men what's happening is that both parties have come together to completely shit on society based on hedonistic reasons only so it's like the more people chase that fucking hedonism the more society is going to downslide but yeah i think i'm probably going to end it there uh, running for four hours and 11 minutes, but it's been really great. I appreciate you dropping by Emmanuel, David, if you come back and watch the end of this, it's really nice seeing you too. Um, we got a decent amount of people dropping by every once in a while, even a bot, which was really nice. It's a rare, you get to see a bot. But yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah. But dude, it's like some guys, they do need help. And again, when it comes to that conditioning, bro, sometimes it, it can just be a couple words of advice. Sometimes it's like a long fight, but dedicating yourself to help others, it's a noble deed. I respect it. It's just something you got to do without burning yourself out because many people will drag you down, even if they don't mean to, they'll drag you down into the abyss with them. So like if, if you're trying to help people with their hentai addiction, you need to fully fucking be confident that you've really conquered yours not only to give yourself credibility but bro you do not want to get sucked back into a hole that you're already getting out of you do not want to be the crab at the top of the bucket getting pinched by the back leg and dragged back down so just like those dudes who are former alcoholics that do alcoholics anonymous and relapse you got to be careful so like only when you're genuinely ready to, to really put your foot out there should you really like be reaching out to folks to try to help them because it is, it is really tough and really burdensome to, uh, to help people with uh, something as strong as hentai addiction. But yeah, man, it's been great. And again, to those watching, I know that the Devonian stream was supposed to be like more like the others where it really just kind of focused on the Devonian, whatever. I'll put like little timestamps, I guess, for when like the conversation kind of turned away from that. But I did cover the key points. So it's been, it has been awesome though. Like I always love talking about, um, aspects of the manosphere, aspects of dating. And I'll probably have these like kind of fusion tier streams. I did have like the standalone sex quest video. 
So just so you know, I'm probably going to be incorporating more and in, more of that into my critiques and streams as they go on. This is what I love about streaming. I don't edit shit. I let everything just go. If they want to copyright strike me, cool. I don't care. Um, I, this is mostly just educational content. Even these like kind of rants and rambles are educational. But yeah, I try my best to help people along. I don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. And those telling you they have all the answers are bullshit. All we can do is our best become the best version of ourselves that we can be and just try to get along in this crazy world. So yeah, dude, thanks for, uh, thanks for attending to those watching in the future. I, I appreciate the viewership as well. I hope you all have a great and wonderful Saturday night. Ciao, ciao.